Yotsuya Yusuke, along with his classmates Shindu Yu and Hakazaki Kusue, have been transported to a strange and unknown world inhabited by mythological creatures. As soon as they arrive, they meet somebody calling himself the Game Master, who then grants them a time-limited quest. To aid them in this quest, he also bestows Shindu and Hakazaki with the roles of a magician and a warrior, while Yotsuya is randomly granted the role of a farmer? This is how a hectic life of adventuring began for three students who now have no choice but to complete random quests for several phases in the fantasy world if they want to stay alive and protect the real world from the demons and monsters they encounter. The story kicks off in Tokyo showing people and students going to their various workplaces and high schools. The PE teacher calls out the roll call of the students, noticing one of the students is absent. The students behind keep talking, saying Hakozaki Kusue, who is absent, always does so during their PE period, because she has a condition that always makes her weak. The PE teacher reminds the students about the form of their future plans, saying they have until tomorrow to submit it. Afterward, the students continue their daily activities. Some of the male students keep admiring Shindao san saying she is cute and also has good grades. In their words, she is perfect. Back at home, Yotsuya Yusuke plays a video game in his room shouting excitedly. Soon afterward, he is back into his moody ways. The next day in school, Yotsuya Yusuke sees Shindo-san, whom he secretly admires. He thinks about yesterday, when he was looking at her photo on his phone, saying she is beautiful, lost in his own thoughts. He looks back and notices that Hakozaki Kusue, who is always absent in PE period, is chatting with Shindo-san. He keeps wondering when they become friends. They stare back at Yotsuya Yusuke, making him startled. Later in the day, the PE teacher asks Yotsuya Yusuke why he is the only one yet to submit his future plans form, stating that he is a fast runner, and if he had joined the school track team, he could have gotten into an athletic high school. His eyes drift towards Shindan San and Hakozaki Kusue, wondering what both of them are doing together. His teacher asks him again if there is nothing he wants to do in the future. He answers through his thoughts, saying he just wants to go home and play his video game. His PE teacher later on, tells him to open up to friends if he really wants to finish high school. Yotsuya Yusuke is surprised that his teacher knows he does not open up to people. His teacher later on tells him to submit his form tomorrow, and he leaves the class. Yotsuya Yusuke looks back to tell both Hakozaki and Shindo that he will lock up the classroom, but they have left, making him the only one in the classroom. Suddenly, he is being transported into a fantastical and mysterious world. Upon getting into this mysterious world, he finds out that both Shindu-san and Hakozaki Kusue are already in the world. Shindu San warns him not to panic, that a weirdo with half a head is about to show up. Upon the Game Master's arrival, Yotsuya Yusuke panics. The Game Master explains the rules of the game-like world they now inhabit, saying they have to fulfill the village's chief request within 14 days. Each quest they complete earns them points. The Game Master tells Yotsuya to ask both Shindon San and Hakozaki Kusue about the rewards they will earn after the completion of each quest. They are assigned roles. Shindo San is assigned wizard, Hakozaki Kusue is assigned warrior, and Yotsuya Yusuke is assigned farmer. Yotsuya later on asked whether they were also brought into the game like world without warning. Shindo replied to him, saying it was only just her. She said on the completion of her first quest, she returned back to the real world, but the game master instructed her to do another quest. She explains how her second quest is to become friends with Kusue. After the quest, both Shindo and Kusuo are given another quest to become friends with Yotsuya. Now, Shindo puts Yotsuya through how to navigate his character's powers. They come across a log point which stores scenes that have already happened in the past. Sindon tells Yotsuya that log points can be viewed just by touching them. Soon, they saw goblins near a village. Yotsuya charges towards them, thinking he can easily defeat them. Realizing he is not strong enough, asks for help from his teammates, but Shindu's power level is low, and Kusu is also afraid of combat. Afterward, Yotsuya is eliminated by a goblin, fearing he may have perished in combat but after 30 seconds he is revived back. He later tells Shindu that he will have to sacrifice himself for every goblin to be annihilated. Shindu tells him he doubts his plan will work, but it does, hence explaining to him why it is dangerous for the three of them to die at once, which will lead to their death in the real world. Yuxi asks both of them what the reward is after the completion of each quest, but Shindo replies, you only have a chance to ask the Game Master one question. Furthermore, she says, she asked the Game Master why she was chosen, the Game Master replied, that someone she knows requested it. Also, Kusue says, she also asked the Game Master, who are they? The Game Master replied to her, they are from the future. Yotsuya is on the lookout, still deliberating that if the three of them die in this world, they will also die in the real world. Not quite long after, 
Usui calls Yotsuya out for help. On getting there he sees a big monster, who later eats Shindo-san, knowing he won't be able to fight against the monster, and his death might lead to their death in the real world. He hurriedly carries Kusue to a safer place. Currently in a safe place, Yotsuya sees that the left hand of Kusue is not regenerating back. Upon seeing this, he knows Shindo-san may not revive back, and the death of them all will be their death in the real world. He thinks to himself, they have to leave the monster and must complete their quest without Shindu San. Upon their arrival in the village, the villagers call them heroes, and a little girl namely, Seika says he wants to be strong like them. But to Yotsuya, it is just a game, and they are not as strong as the villagers think they are. Afterward, they are with the village chief. He says they have to help them eliminate a troll that has just shown up outside their village. Yotsuya, seeing that it is the big monster that ate Shindon San, Wales, saying they are dead. Yotsuya asks Kusue if she has annihilated a goblin before. In her defense, her sword is not cutting through them. Yotsuya replies saying, you are only throwing the sword at them. Kusue says they have to find a way to revive Shindo-san back. But Yotsuya thinks to himself, she is useless, and that it would have been better if he was stuck with Shindo-san. Yotsuya, now leaving the village. Kusue asks him where he is going and he tells her to stay with the villagers, that he wants to find a way to raise his rank. But Kusue says she also wants to save Shindu-san. Yotsuya replies that if she dies now, he will be the one going through hell. As he walks away, he thinks to himself, even though everybody's life is in danger, that this world is more exciting than Tokyo. Now, on the outskirts of the village, Yotsuya must find some goblins to annihilate, to increase his rank, or else he will be fed on by the monster, just like Shindu-san. Soon, he sees a log point. The log point shows Shindo-san asking Kusue if they get a guy to the team, who she wants it to be, she replies, saying Yamada-kun. Yamada-kun plays judo for the national team. Shindo-san replies that is not what I meant. She, later on says, I mean, a guy you really like. But Kusue says, she does not like guys. Shindo-san replies saying that makes both of us. But to Yotsuya's surprise, Shindo-san mentioned him, as the guy she really likes. But since there are two Yotsuya in their school, he says he may not be the one, but as soon as Shindo-san wants to mention the Yotsuya she picks, the log point vanishes. Yotsuya, looking down at the village from the forest, says to himself that the view takes him back to the serenity of Tokyo City. Soon he sees a few goblins in the forest, and within seconds he charges toward them, thereby annihilating some, but one of the goblins gets away. His rank increases but he still contemplates that his tank would have been boosted higher. If the goblin did not get away, he hopes he can get a better character assigned to him. Afterward, he finds out that Hakozaki is dead, he says is not she in the village. But upon checking afar from the forest side, he finds out the village has been attacked, Remembering their quest is to keep the villagers safe. He runs hurriedly towards the village. Upon getting to the village, he finds out that Hakozaki has been eaten by the monster because she is not reviving back, which means if he also dies, they will be all dead in the real world. He sees a log point, and in the log point, Hakozaki and Sekas are talking, where he finds out that Hakozaki has been living a difficult life in Tokyo, and she finds life better in the game-like world but it also seems she has been a burden to Shindu-san and Yotsuya Yusuke. Soon, Yotsuya realizes he has only been thinking about himself, in the game-like world, and also in the real world. In the log point, Hakozaki sacrifices herself in order for the villagers to get to safety, and calls for help from Yotsuya. Yotsuya sees the troll and tries running away, but he is flung away by the troll's hand. Now, he thinks to himself, that he has not cared for anybody since his graduation from high school, but until the very moment he knows about the life Hakazaki has been living, he takes it upon himself, he will surely have to defeat the troll. He sees that the troll can only jump like a frog because of his eye dash, hoping he will be able to shake him off, but the troll keeps charging at him. Fortunately for him, he sees a goblin, and he immediately eliminates the goblin, making his rank increase and making the game pause. The game master appears to him, saying it is time to spin the wheel for him to be assigned a new job, but Yotsuya really wishes he would be assigned a warrior. When the spinning wheel stops, it stops on Chef, realizing the Chef is still weak, but a Chef has a blade, and also gains internal knowledge of common beasts. The game master returns the flow time of the game to the norm. Yotsuya hurriedly slashes the troll's stomach with his blade, reviving both Shindon-san and Hakozaki Kusue back to life. They both thank Yotsuya for reviving them back. Shindo-san asks Yotsuya why he is wearing other clothes, which is a chef. Now, the three of them attack the troll multiple times, but all attacks towards the troll do not work. Yotsuya remembers what Shindo-san told him about her ability to control wind. Afterward, he sacrifices himself by attacking the troll in its open stomach, and Shindo-san 
launches a counterattack. By launching enough air into the troll's body, the troll is eliminated. The Game Master appears again, congratulating them on the completion of their quest. Their rank increases. The Game Master tells Yotsuya that his reward for completing the quest is to ask one question. He remembers what both Shindu-san and Hakozaki Kuswa asked him. After the completion of their quest, he asks, what's the tenth step of the quest? The Game Master shows him what they will do at the tenth step. Shockingly, they see a big monster. But soon, they are back in the real world. Kusue asks if they are expected to fight the big monster. Shindu-san says to forget about it and that she is going to practice. The wall clock is still the same as they left before the game-like world. Shindo-san thanked Yotsuya for his help, saying that she would be able to play in the school tournament she had prepared for. She then bid both Yotsuya and Kusui goodbye. She tells Yotsuya to make sure Kusui gets home safely. Now both Yotsuya and Kusui are on their way home. Yotsuya thinks to himself that they are in the game-like world for more than a day, and time does not pass in the real world and they have to make it through seven times or else they all die. Kusui also thanks Yotsuya for his help in reviving them back. He replied to her that as long as one of them stays alive, it benefits them all. He also realizes that if he quits the quest, the city, he hates so much, can be destroyed. Hakozaki tells Shindu-san what Yusuke told him on their way home. One of Shindu-san's teammates sees her giggling over the phone and asks, What's the matter? Shindu-san replies, inquiring what she knows about Yotsuya, because Hoshi, her teammate, went to the same grad school as Yotsuya. Hoshi replies that Yotsuya is an antisocial type and also asks Shindo-san why she wants to know anything about Yotsuya. Shindo-san replies by saying she had the chance to talk to him and she really wants to know the kind of person Yotsuya is. Afterward, Yotsuya is jogging and thinks to himself that he really prefers to jog in the mountains of the game-like world and not on the concrete of Tokyo City. He questions why they chose him to defend the city he hates so much. The Game Master calls Yotsuya on his phone. He wonders how the Game Master is able to call him, but later on knows it won't be a challenge to the Game Master. The Game Master gives him a mission to woo a girl in a high school. Furthermore, telling him his success or failure will influence his chances in the next quest. On getting to the high school, the Game Master instructs him to go upstairs and enter into the girl's restroom. Now inside the girl's restroom, he sees a girl being bullied by three other girls. He asks the Game Master, which one is he to woo? The Game Master replies to him saying the one at the center with glasses on. He sees that the other girls bullying the girl at the center are with phones and may have taken pictures or videos of the girl's nakedness, which may lead to her committing suicide, and the possibility of his next quest success may be jeopardized, meaning his also dying. Without hesitation, he breaks the other three girls' phones and also thinks he will be able to get his first girlfriend. The three girls run away calling him crazy, saying they will call the police on him. Yotsuya flushes the broken phones and says he is just passing by and coincidentally saves her. But the girl replies, this is a girl's restroom, and later thanks him. Now, Yotsuya is escorting the girl home, but the girl hopes Yotsuya leaves her alone because she does not know what his intentions are. Yotsuya, enjoying the mission, asks her if the other girls are really bullying her. She replies to Yotsuya that it is not like they are bullying her, but getting back at her because she said the other girl who was actually filming her likes to act nice around boys because the girl and her stream on the Miko Live. She says, the girl thinks I am talking about her on the show, and she is actually not wrong but I didn't mention her name. She feels sad and starts crying. Yotsuya is now wondering how he is going to comfort a crying girl without getting arrested, and also, Game Master is not calling him back. She stops crying and tells Yotsuya she will be fine getting home from here. They both wish each other goodbyes, but she turns around to tell Yotsuya about a game the girls have been into lately and also tells him if can do what the guys in the game do. It may work out some modeling practice for Yotsuya, and she runs away. At home, Yotsuya checks the game the girl told her about earlier, and he feels he has wasted two weeks of his life, but soon, he is transported into the game-like world. The girl, the game master, told Yotsuya to woo whom he also saved from bullying, and is also with them in the world. Her new environment frightens her, but not quite long, the Game Master appears behind her and touches her. Upon seeing the Game Master, she becomes more scared and starts crying. The Game Master spins the wheel for the new girl Tokitat Yuka to be assigned a job which automatically makes her the fourth player. After the wheel stops spinning, the new job assigned to her is a wizard. She can control heat. The Game Master also increases their reviving time from 30 seconds to 40 seconds and tells them their quest is to traverse 5% of the map and deliver goods to Radodorbo within 40 days. Yotsuya tries asking 
the game master what goods are they to deliver, but the game master wishes them good luck and disappears. Yotsuya wants to talk to Tokitate, but it seems she is scared of him and calls him a stalker. She says, it is not a coincidence that he follows her home and abducts her after and that she has already tried to reconcile with the other three girls. Afterward, Shindo-san suggests they all split up so they can cover more distance by completing the requirement to traverse 5% of the map of their quest. Shindo-san asks Tokitate about her talking to Yotsuya earlier and about the three girls trying to bully her. Tokitate replies that she just wants to reconcile with the other three girls since she gave them a reason to attack her, and also she sees Yotsuya as a mutual enemy. Shindo-san replies that she is stuck with her classmates now anyway. Toki Tatayuka says she can't imagine Shindo-san being bullied, but Shindo-san replies, saying she is only half right. Afterward, Yotsuya thinks they are still avoiding him when a big bug corpse falls behind him. A centipede comes out from the bug corpse, throwing a pill bug at them. Yotsuya, using his chef skills, identifies the centipede's name and threat level, where the pill bug is the male and the centipede is the female. Tokitati tries attacking the centipede, but her power bar diminishes quickly and has no effect on the centipede since her magic is in rank 1. Yotsuya charges toward the pill bug, eliminating them furiously with his blade. He also finds the blind spot of the centipede, which is the back of the centipede. He cuts the legs off and asks Hakazaki if he can hold her hand to finish off the centipede, because players cannot hold another player's weapon. The centipede is eliminated, and both Yotsuya and Hakazaki rank increases. Now Shindo-san dreams about when she was a young girl and met a lady called Sanyuri, but not quite long after, Sanyuri died. Everybody mocks her for being ugly, even after her death. She wakes up and sees Yotsuya working out. Yotsuya asks her whether she is crying because she is not quite herself after waking up. Shindo-san replies, why did he ask? He says it just came to his mind. Shindo-san replies that she does not pick him for the observant one, and she holds Yotusha's hand, saying, Help me. Now, they are at the village where a troll attacked during their third quest. The village is now in ruins. Tokitate asks Yotsuya whether they are in the same village. He says yes it is because he remembers the village building. A stranger passing stops and he immediately recognizes them as heroes. Tokitate asks Yotsuya what he means by heroes, and he replies that the people of this world recognize players at first glance and call them heroes. The stranger says whenever he is traveling, he stops at the village which has been more than five years now, and the village has always been deserted. Yotsuya thinks to himself whether time moves faster in this world than in theirs. Hakazaki also remembers Sekas, and she hopes he is still alive and in a safer place. Shindo-san says they are really hoping they can gather some information from the village Yotsuya asks the stranger what he knows about Radodorbo. He shows them a map, showing Radodorbo at the edge of the continent. He furthermore tells them they can get to Radodorbo within 30 days, with horses but on foot will be three times longer. Shindo-san begs the stranger for his horse, but he says his horse is vital to his work and cannot spare it even for the heroes. Furthermore, the stranger tells them about a martial arts tournament coming up in the nearby town of Portonel, and also tells them that the reward for the winner of the tournament is three horses, and he goes on his way. Yotsuya says winning the tournament is their first quest, and they still have enough time to level up their experience points. On their way to annihilate a few goblins to level up their experience points, humans who are bandits charge at them, but Yotsuya attacks one of them, making the game master reduce his experience points. Yotsuya tells his teammates to retreat because harming humans counts as excessive self-defense and their experience points will be reduced. But Shindo-san turns back and attacks the bandits. Yotsuya, Kusue, and Tokitate, getting to safety, realize that Shindon-san has been captured by the bandits. Yotsuya suggests they face the quest at hand and leave Shindo-san because once the quest is completed, they can all go back home but both Kusue and Tokitate suggest they all go back and save Shindo-san. Tokitate replies saying he overheard Shindo-san telling Yotsuya to help her the other night. Yotsuya also replies to Tokitate saying by completing the quest, he is helping her. But Kusue says, saving someone's life isn't all there is to saving them. Yotsuya suggests they split. He goes to the martial arts tournament and leaves the task of saving Shindo-san to both Kusue and Tokitate. Yotsuya says to himself, it's just like last time, and he is on his own again. Both Kusue and Tokitete, on their way to save Shindo-san, are also captured by the bandits. Yotsuya sees on the map that both Kusue and Tokitete 
have been captured. He says he is really on his own. He sees a few goblins in the forest without hesitation. He annihilates every one of them. His experience point increases, and the game master spins the wheel for him to be assigned a new power. The wheel stops spinning at the wizard sign. His new power makes him able to control creatures, and also his rank decreases. Now in the town of Cordonel, Yotsuya faces his opponent in the martial arts tournament. He thinks maybe if he is able to win the tournament and get the reward of three horses, he will be able to save Shindo-san, Kusui, and Tokitede, and he will finally become popular. Shindo-san and Tokitede show their frustration and complain in the cell that Yotsuya is not even making an attempt to save them, but Hakozaki is only thinking about Yotsuya's well-being. In the tournament, Yotsuya is killed by Kavel the knight within seconds, but he revives back. Also finding out the knight is a girl, he feels pathetic, but goes on to beg the knight if she can lend him the horses, saying he needs to be in Radadorbo before 35 days. He pleads more if he can do some work for the knight in exchange for the horses within 5 days. The knight replies, she will lend him the horses, if only he also will help them annihilate some monsters. Finding a troll to eliminate may take up to 5 days she says. Yotsuya remembers the bandits who abducted his teammates and says, what if they eliminate them instead? Yotsuya and Kavel give the army commander the location of the bandits. Yotsuya hopes he will be given the three horses after the information he just gave the commander. The commander thanks him and replies that he will only be able to give him one horse. Kavel and Yotsuya both walk in the street of the town of Cortona. He asks Kavel so they can attack the bandits before daybreak. Kavel replies to him saying they have nearly half a day and she asks if Yotsuya is interested in sword practice in the meantime. She also sees that he is a novice in sword fighting. Yotsuya ponders that with one horse, he may be the only one to make it to Rotodorbo. He, later on, tells Kavel he will appreciate training with her. During the sword training practice, Kavel tells Yotsuya he is improving more than before they start training, and she ranks his sword skill at the low end of mid-range. But Yotsuya ponders that, after becoming wizard, has turned his abilities to average, and it is bringing back his old inferiority complex. Kavel explains to Yotsuya that the problem is his form, and that if he is able to practice a thousand swings every day, he will improve. It is daybreak, and Kavel motivates the soldiers to battle. In the bandit cell, Yotsuya's teammates see him on the map, coming toward their location. They believe he has won the tournament and is coming to save them. Two bandits patrolling inside the forest are eliminated, and Kavel orders the soldiers to charge at the remaining bandits. One of the bandits attacks Yotsuya, but he immediately counterattacks him and lands him a deafening punch. He realizes, as long as he's not the one to attack a human first but just counter the attacks, his experience level will not be affected. The bandits see they cannot defeat the army and release a beast out of its cage, where the remaining bandits on the battlefield run away. Kavel orders Makawa to take 10 people with him and chase after the running bandits. Yotsuya asks Kavel what type of monster it is, she replies, a berserker. Furthermore, explaining to Yotsuya what a berserker is, eating flesh imbued with more magic than a human can digest causes one to lose reason and turn into a berserker. Kavel without hesitation charges towards the berserker but with a single swing from the berserker breaks her shield. Kavel furiously draws out her sword called Roy Kayesksa, also known as the Great Sword of Annihilation. Yotsuya is impressed upon seeing the size differences, and Kavel is still putting in a good fight, but he knows Kavel will soon run out of stamina. Soon, the Berserker puts Kavel off balance, but Yotsuya defends her with his own weapon. His weapon breaks into two, and having nothing to defend himself, remembers his abilities as a wizard. By increasing his word's persuasiveness, he tells the Berserker someone is trying to attack him from behind and the berserker complies and swings its sword backward. Yotsuya immediately stabs the berserker in the stomach with his blade, but the berserker annihilates him with just one blow. This puts the berserker off guard. Kavel swings her sword with full force, cutting the berserker's head off. After rescuing Shindo-san, Kusue, and Tokitate, Kavel says she will escort the heroes to Radodorbo and only demand two things in payment. Firstly, on getting to Radodorbo, she will have to collect the horseback. Yotsuya says that is not a problem since they won't be needing it anymore. Secondly, she says she wants to train the four of them in swordsmanship. Kusui says she needs it more because she is a warrior. And off they go to Radodorbo. It is almost nightfall on their way to Radodorbo. They stop to make camp and rest their horses. Yotsuya cooks for his companions, but Kusui still cannot eat because of the event that happened at the bandit's den. Shindusan tells her, it does not really matter if she has lost her appetite, because they do not really get hungry in this world. She replies to Shindusan that she just wants to protect everyone in this world, including her friends, but she can't even protect herself. 
and it looks like she is holding everybody back. Makua tells Yotsuya he feels bad for cooking their dinner, but he replies to Makua that cooking is his thing. Tokitate says Yotsuya just wants experience points. Yotsuya explains more to Makua that he is now at rank 10 meaning he can now use big cooking utensils. Shindo-san on looking at Yotsuya says, it seems he is doing fine. Kusui ponders that it is only the ones with physical strength that gain levels and have access to everything. Kavel calls on Yotsuya for them to start their training. Tokitate asks Yotsuya that Kavel help him to train. He replies to Tokitate that out of the hundred matches they did, he was only able to beat her just three times, and she even switched to a real sword and hacked him up within an inch of his life, and that he also thinks he was in hell. Tokitate ponders on what Kavel told them when they were rescued from the bandit's den. She says Kavel felt so happy about training with them. Hence Kavel tells Tokitate she is starting with her and will start attacking in the next five seconds. In a few seconds, Tokitate looks battered and she says knowing they feel less pain in this world, but it still hurts getting sliced up. Kavel calls on his next trainee, Kusue. Kusue feeling tired on the ground, Kavel tells her, she's unable to lift a longsword, and that it will likely take time for her to improve, but Kusue wonders if the modern Japan she lives in is so peaceful. One of Kevel's subordinates, Makua, comes limping and tells her they were attacked by goblins when gathering firewood but Kavel feels disappointed in him for having been injured by goblins. Kusue stands up and ponders that it was when she came to this world that everything fell apart. Now in their camp, Yotsuya is using his magic to heal Makua, his injury. Shindo-san says she doesn't know he has a healing power, but he replies he is only speeding up his cellular metabolism so that the wound can heal faster and he can't surpass his natural regenerative ability. Tokitate complains that Yotsuya as a chef also does not need to fight before gaining experience. She adds that it's unfair, but Yotsuya replies she should not complain to him, but take it up to the system. Kusue in the carriage ponders that they cannot escape the system they have been forced into. The next day, both Kusue and Kavel are training together. Kusu says she wants to become stronger so as to protect everyone and gain more experience points, but it seems she is still unable to carry the longsword. Kavel says she is improving, but still needs a lot of time and practice to be able to use the longsword effectively. She knocks Kusue out. Afterward, Makua runs toward them saying they have found a horde of goblins. Bimsberg, one of Kavel's subordinates, asks her whether they should take a detour, but she replies to him that it will be better if they eliminate the goblins. Yotsuya suggests the heroes annihilate the goblin by themselves since they have been training and will need to gain more experience points. Yotsuya urges his teammates to charge towards the goblins. Kavel says she's more concerned about Kusue taking a longsword to fight goblins. The heroes attack, furiously annihilating the horde of goblins but Kusue gets scared as she sees a goblin on top of a tree. Kavel comes to her aid but Kusui points her longsword toward the goblin, eliminating the goblin instantly. She feels pitiful and starts crying. Later in the night in the camp, Yotsuya complains that their experience points barely move up after the work. Tokitate replies that it is because his rank is already higher than theirs. Shindu-san says she heard Kusue had eventually killed a goblin, but Kusue ponders that she is still feeling the squishing feeling of flesh giving way, so she shrugs. Kavel says she feels sad for not being able to kill any goblin. Kusui asks her why she enjoys cutting living flesh so much. She replies that it is the sensation as it progresses from living to dead from the outside in, adding that within the brief instant after she swings her sword downward and also the way it feels on her hand. She says it is all intoxicating to her. The heroes are mesmerized by what they just heard. Kavel notes that some goblins may still be around the forest and she calls her subordinates to patrol the forest together. Yotsuya tells his teammates what Kavel's dad told him when he, they were in the town of Cortinel. He says, when Kavel was a young girl, she heard what her dad told her older brother during training, that going up against living opponents with a real sword provides the most experience. Yotsuya says she twisted the words as a young girl. Kusu ponders that she will protect everyone and go back home alive to realize her dream, so she has to cut flesh also. As they journey, their cart gets stuck in a hole, but soon both Beamsburg, Makua, and Yotsuya push the cart outside the hole and move on. Yotsuya checks the remaining time to complete their quest on the map and sees they only have 15 days and 5 hours left. As they journey on, Shindo-san calls the attention of Kavel to a group of army soldiers fighting some monsters. Kavel checks through her microscope and sees a child among the group of people being attacked by the monsters. Kusue, hearing a child is among them, urges his teammates to help the soldiers, but Yotsuya says time is not on their side. 
she insists even if she will be the only one to help, and also, reminds Yotusha about what she told him the other time saying, saving someone's life isn't all there is to saving them. She also adds that if she abandons the child, there is no point in living the rest of her life. Yotsuya thinks it through, that it may be some sort of trap from the game master, and the people may be their gateway to Radodorbo. He suggests they split up and he follows Kusue to save the civilians. He and Kusui charge toward the monsters, and Yotsuya is able to identify the monster with one of his abilities as a chef. They battle with the monsters, but the monsters are just too strong for them. He also tries to use one of his abilities as a wizard, but the monster just keeps annihilating both him and Kusu. Kusu in her spirit form, waiting to revive, back ponders, what is the point of being here if she cannot protect herself? She revives back and says if she keeps getting protected all the time, she won't amount to anything. The monster charges toward her. She just stands there and draws her long sword at the very last second before the monster pounces on her, making it easier to kill the monster and also not feeling the weight of the long sword. Yotsuya, having to see this all, wonders if Kusue's character has changed. Yotsuya later on sees Kyavel's carriage charging towards them. He lures the last monster making it easy for Cavill to eliminate. Yotsuya heals the injured child by absorbing magic from the monster's blood to replenish his MP. The army commander thanks Yotsuya for his help. Yotsuya asks who they are. He replies that they are soldiers of the Kingdom of Dia and are transporting these heretics to Radodorbo. He says the criminals they are transporting violate their ban on foreign religion known as Arteros, and since Radodorbo is believed to be home to a large number of Arteros, adding that they will publicly execute them on top of a hill there. There. The heroes all wonder about hearing what the army commander just said. Yotsuya ponders whether these people are the goods, but if they take them to Radodorbo, they will eliminate them, including the child. He also remembers that attacking a human reduces your experience points and wonders more if this is actually part of the quest or do they fail if they do not help the people. Kavil starts to question the vice corporal of the soldiers, Kamilto from the Deox kingdom that they intend to execute their own citizens in a foreign land. She believes Radodorbo does not fall under the authority of Diok's authority. Yotsuya says, the situation looks like a complicated and compulsory event for them, because the goods they are to deliver to Radodorbo are the civilians. Tokitate asks him whether they have to help the kingdom's soldiers in order for them to be able to complete their own quest. He replies to her that they have to, but if they do, the civilians will be executed, including the child. Tokitate asks what they should do. He replies that the people from the future may be looking at them if they will really sacrifice these people, and the result of their actions will be considered a human attack, which means game over for them. Tokitate later on brings up an idea of them escorting the soldiers to Radodorbo and stops the execution of the civilians. Shindu-san asks her teammates if they all agree with the Tokitate idea, and they all nod in agreement, while Yotsuya says it is a better idea. On their way to Radodorbo, one of the soldiers asks Camilto if he is sure to allow the heroes to accompany them, even with a foreign knight among them. Camilto replies that it does not matter, because they cannot kill the prisoners before their execution, and also have to rely on the hero with the healing power. In the Karyaji, Kusue asks Yodoshia if the shield is improving. He replies that he is but he's just a child and he has to take a break since his MP is limited. Yotsuya ponders that what they really need is more information. Almost nightfall, Camilto tells them they have to make a camp now. Later in the night, Yotsuya asks Camilto for an audience with one of the prisoners. In the carriage, the civilian thanks Yotsuya for his help in healing the injured child and identifies himself as Fofkel, a missionary from the continent of Illa. He hopes that the injured child known as Belili can be spared, even though the rest of them are not spared. He says he knows for sure Belili won't be afforded any protection in Radodorbo either. Yotsuya asks why the kingdom of Deok hates Arteros so much. He replies to Yotsuya by explaining how the nation is divided between the citizens who worship the divine being and the citizens who worship both the divine being and the king. He says both sides continue their hostilities, insisting that the other side started it. After prolonged conflicts between them, each side starts destroying everything the other believes in. He says the destruction of the kingdom's successive leader statues was the final straw that led to the prohibition of the religion and execution of its believers. Shindu San says killing people over statues is evil. Fafsel replies that it is a complicated situation that during peaceful times, their divine being, Jesus advocates love and peace, but some believers fail to comprehend what the scripturists say, and the people of the kingdom are divided into use and them. Afterward, Yotsuya asks Kamilto why it is necessary for him to undergo such a dangerous journey just to execute Arteros's believers in Radodorbo. Kamilto replies that it is necessary 
so as to dampen and prevent the believers from propagating further, because the outcome of the war made some orphans, but it was the current king Diok V who changed history by rewarding not only the soldiers who fought in the war, but also those who lost their fathers or sons with one slave each and making his priority to better the lives of his citizens by establishing more colonies in the kingdom's name. Camilto says, it was the king that saved his family from homelessness, so the king truly deserves a unified continent. But to achieve that, the evil arteries religion must be erased from the continent at any cost. Tokatate says she hates dictatorship because it is also like bullying a weak nation, and there is no humanity involved in a great nation, ganging up on a few. She turns to Shin Do San, telling her they should kill the kingdom soldiers, because there is no way all of them will die. Kamilto looks furious hearing this, and asks Tokitate to take back her words, or she dies. But Yotsuya calms him down. The next day, Kamilto tells Yotsuya it will take them seven days to climb the mountain, and from there, it will also take them five days to Radodorbo. Kusue tells Yotsuya that they have 13 days and 20 hours left to complete their quest, so using 12 days to get to Radodorbo is still enough. Cavell asks Kamilto whether they will be able to cross the mountain with horse-drawn carriages. He replies that it is possible, but knows an alternate route that is faster. On getting to the alternate route, they are in a cave house and the moving mechanism they see in a tunnel amazes them, but unknowing to them, Kamilto traps them in the cave house. Now they must find a way out of the cave house. As they are trying to find a way out, Yotsuya gets trapped in another dimension of the cave house. Shindo-san tells him they have to carry on the quest without him. Shindo-san, Kavel, Kusue, Tokitate, and Kavel's subordinates get to another dead end of the cave house, which looks like an arena with mutilated monsters called gargoyles. Yotsuya finds his way out of the entrapment. On his way to his teammates, he sees a log point. It is from the log point he finds out that Bimisberg is dead. He was killed by the kingdom soldiers, and Kavel promised to do anything in her power to take revenge. After the log points disappear, he realizes that Bimisberg's dead body is still there, and that is when he knows he has lost a comrade in arms. He turns back and pays his last respects to Bemisburg, and from there he ponders if he will always be a stranger to everyone. Now in the lookalike arena, Cavell and the heroes battle furiously with the last gargoyle and the vampire bats. Shindu San calls the attention of Cavell to the key on the last gargoyle hand. Cavell says, if they have to get out from inside the cave, they must annihilate the gargoyle but it seems the last gargoyle is the strongest of them all. As they battle with the last gargoyle, Shindu-san thanks Cavell because until recently, she did not realize her potential, and that is why she stopped playing tennis. Cavell advises her to continue playing tennis. She replies to Cavell that she will, but the gargoyle strikes Cavell in the stomach with its blade, and she falls backward into the water surrounding the lookalike arena. Shindu-san, seeing she won't be able to take on the gargoyle by herself, steps backward and coincidentally steps on a vampire bat, making her level up to rank 10. She is surprised that the gargoyle halts before attacking her, and that is when she remembers what Yotsuya told them. If they level up to rank 10, he says time stops for everyone except the game master, and you in which the game master will spin the wheel for you to be assigned a new job. He says before the game master hits the play button and time starts to move again, you only have a few seconds to attack the enemy close to you. She is immediately assigned a new job role, a warrior, and she attacks the gargoyle furiously, but it seems the gargoyle is more powerful than her. She sees a cut on the right side of the gargoyle's abdomen, and she knows instantly that it is Kavel that has left the cut on the gargoyle's body. She remembers what Kavel told her, that if she wants to cause the most fatal wound, it will lead to an instant death of the enemy. It is the heart. She gears up and charges toward the gargoyle furiously, but the gargoyle cuts her right hand off and also breaks her shield. She slides underneath the gargoyle and flips herself onto it. She catches her flinging cut right hand, still holding her sword tightly and with full force, she strikes it into the gargoyle's body. The sword penetrates the gargoyle's shoulder into its heart and kills it instantly. Yotsuya is still finding his way toward his teammates. He ponders what his purpose in this world and the real world is, and he has come to realize the possible answer is that he fits the role of a leader, and also, he is the strongest of them all. He gets to the lookalike arena and sees his teammates, but Makua calls his attention to it that Kavel is down in the water surrounding the lookalike arena. Without hesitation, he jumps into the water to save Kavel. Now, they are out of the cave. Kavel wakes up, and Makua tells her that it was Yotsuya who healed her wound by absorbing the magic in the monster's blood with the determination to heal her. He says that Yotsuya falls asleep like a dead person after the process. Later in the night, Kusue tells them they have less than seven days to complete their quest. Yotsuya wakes up all of a sudden 
sudden screaming that he had it all wrong. He explains to his teammates that goods are something that you can sell, and also things worth transporting long distances. He asks them what they think village chief means. Shindu-san replies that it means the leader of a village. Yotsuya continues to explain how their third quest is to fulfill the village chief's request, but no village was specified nor any person named. He says the goblins they usually see are a type called Merry Goblins, and he is sure of it, that there are other goblins in this world. Yotsuya says goods can also be classified as anything, as long as they count it toward the completion of their quest. Yotsuya tells his teammates that there is a higher possibility that the condemned convicts are not the goods because no one in Radodorbo is waiting to accept them nor there is an advance notice of any exchange to be made. But Kusue tries to convince Yotsuya that if they leave the convicts, the convicts will all surely die, including the child. Yotsuya replies to Kusue that there is still a chance the convicts are the goods and he suggests they split up again. They have less than seven days and one hour left to complete their quest. They split into two teams. Team A consists of Shindo-san, Kusue, and Makua. They are given the task to search for cargo bound for Radodorbo, or any merchant heading to Radodorbo, and also offer to escort them. Team B consists of Yotsuya, Kavel, and Tokitate. They are to follow the trail of the Diok soldiers. Later in the night, at Team B camp, Kavel says the Diok soldiers are yet to know they have made it out of the cave, so eliminating them in an ambush may work well enough, but she says before the Deok soldiers locked them in the cave, the Deok soldiers have already communicated with the kingdom by sending a letter through a bird. It is likely they have notified the kingdom that they are going to trap some enemy heroes and Cortinel soldiers. She says, killing the Deok soldiers now will likely give the kingdom an excuse to declare war against Cortinel. She doesn't want her own actions to destroy her beloved country because the kingdom has 10 times more soldiers than theirs. Yotsuya replies that what they have to do is convince the kingdom by making the Deok soldiers write another letter, claiming Cortinel is not the enemy, but they also cannot force the soldiers to write the letter, nor write it for them. Yotsuya ponders that it is very likely if they later convince the Deok soldiers to write another letter, that the kingdom may ignore the content of the letter and just start a war with Cortinel. He says even though he still wants to take revenge on the Deok soldiers, Yotsuya and his team catch up with the Deok soldiers the next day, but he says it is not the right time to attack them. Later at night, in the Deok soldiers' camp, Camilto tells his squad that they have three days left to get to Radadorbi and execute the heretics for performing foreign religion. Yotsuya shows up at the Deok soldiers' camp and says, he is here to negotiate. He also lies to them that the four people from Cortinel died in the cave and two of the heroes are trapped in a hole. He lies to the Deok soldiers that only he and Tokitete came out of the cave. He calls forth Tokitete. Tokitete lies to the Deok soldiers, saying that Yotsuya is now converted to the religion of Arteros. Hence, Yotsuya tells them he is here to negotiate with them to release his other three fellow believers. He says if they do not, he will use his immortality to spread the saints' teachings all over the world. He says to them, they only have until sunrise to decide, but if they hurt or kill the believers before sunrise, he says that the deal is off and they better make a decision before sunrise. The Deok soldiers are still deliberating on what to do. Camilto then tells his squad that they have to capture and lock the heroes up. Tokitate once again shows up at their camp, and she says she is here to betray Yotsuya because she and Yotsuya don't really get along. She says if they want to capture Yotsuya, she is willing to show them where he sleeps. Camilto tells one of his soldiers to wait and guard the convicts. The other soldier and Camilto follow Tokitate, but after some time they know it is a trap and capture Tokitate. As they walk back to their camp with Tokitate captured, they see that Yotsuya has already killed the Arteros, but unknown to them, it is just clothes. The breathing and struggling body on the ground is the guard Camilto told to stay back and guard the Arteros. Yotsuya also sets the Deox soldier's horse Arse on fire making the horse run away because of the excruciating pain. He also set fire on the struggling soldier. Yotsuya and Tokitate escape on a horse, leaving the Deok soldiers on foot and also luring them away from the campsite. Yotsuya tells Tokitate that the Deok soldiers now have a reason to write to the kingdom, that Kavil and others from Cortinel are dead, and also, it is the heroes that interfered with them to get revenge. He says the relationship between Cortinel and Deok will remain unchanged for now. At the Team A camp, Shindo-san says they have yet to come across a single wagon after three days now, and hope the other team is doing fine. The Arteros now rescued are in a cave. They thank the heroes for everything. The injured child is now awake. He thanks both Yotsuya and Tokitate for their help, 
and also calls Tokitate a pretty lady. Outside the cave, Tokitat asks Yotsuya whether it is worth killing someone to stop a war. He replies that it is more important because it was a request from a friend, and also, one of their friends was killed by the Deok soldiers. He also tells her not to forget that her own is also on the line. Yotsuya's rank drops from 9 to 7 as a result of the Deok soldier he set on fire. An attack on a human counts as excessive self-defense. At the palace of the Diok kingdom, one of the king's servants notifies him about the failure of the Diok soldiers. He asks the king if they should send a rescue team to the Diok soldiers. The king declines because there are only two survivors. The servant tells the king that the greater problem now is that the heroes who are supposed to be neutral toward humanity have now become their enemies and they must consider the worst scenario. The king then orders the servant to research different ways to kill the heroes. Afterward, at the Team B camp, Yotsuya says they don't know the content of the letter and cannot really tell if their plan worked. Tokitate replies that in her own opinion the plan worked and also they were able to free the captives. <laughs> she says the main objective is getting the goods to Radodorbo. And it appears that Team A is not getting the task done anytime soon. Yotsuya says he wants to try out three things pertaining to the goods. Team A is in a settlement. Shindo-san and Kusue see a merchant and ask him whether he has goods or cargo bound for Radodorbo. He replies to them that he doesn't. They thank the merchant and go on their way. Yotsuya's team sets to journey to Radodorbo, along with the three Arteros. They stop more often on the road because the carriage is now carrying more people. Kavel tells Yotsuya that at their current pace, they will reach Radodorbo in two days' time, and their journey together is almost over. Tokitati notices there have been some changes in Kavel lately. She is also aware that Kavel is into Yotsuya, and Kavel does not know how she will confess her feelings to Yotsuya. Tokitate plans to use the storyline in the game she usually plays in the real world and make Kavel confess her feelings to Yotsuya. Team B stops to rest and also feeds the horses. Tokitate's first plan for making Kavel confess her feelings is called the Get the Two Alone plan. The plan means, if there are two people in a tight space, there is a higher possibility their affection levels rise. She checks inside the wagon to see if her plan worked, but she's disappointed to see both of them sleeping. On their next stop, Tokitate's second plan is a shared task plan. The plan means trust deepens more when two people perform tasks together. She tells both Yotsuya and Kavel to train together. Yotsuya insists that they don't need to train in the middle of the day. Tokitate replies that they do not have much time left to learn from Kavel. Tokitate ponders that Kavel can just carve her love into Yotsuya and make sure she can leave with no regrets. Kavel suggests they switch sides and calls Tokitate to train with her. Tokitate complains that the training is really not about her, but Kavel insists she is the one who brought up the idea of them training together. As they journey on, Tokitate sees that neither of her plans is working and changes nothing about the fact that Kavel has yet to confess her feelings to Yotsuya. She gets mad and frustrated, blaming the game. At the Team A location, Kusue calls the attention of the others that there must be a delivery company that transports cargo in this world. Luckily for them, the delivery company has a monthly delivery today. They stop the delivery man and ask whether he has goods bound for Radodorbo and if he does not mind if they also escort him to Radodorbo. He replies that he does have goods bound for Radodorbo and he also does not mind if they escort him to Radodorbo. A security man following the delivery man stands up from inside the cargo and says he does not want competition, even though they are heroes. He tries to fight Shindo-san, but the fight only lasts seconds. Later in the night at Yotsuya team camp, Kavel thanks Yotsuya for helping her avenge Bimsburg and that she is deeply grateful. She says she has wanted to say that, but finds the timing difficult. Toki Tate, pretending to be asleep and eavesdropping on their conversation wonders if that's all Kavel wanted to say. Yotsuya explains the three things he wants to try out concerning the good task. The first is to get the three condemned convicts to the church, where they will be safe. The second is to sell the personal items of the Dead Kingdom soldiers, and this may get their quest done. Afterward, they present three boxes to the leaders of Radodorbo. The three boxes contain the severed heads of the Diok Kingdom soldiers. Kamilto and one of the Kingdom soldiers were annihilated by Kavel. Their quest to bring goods to Radodorbo is cleared. Kavel tells the leaders if they need more evidence, the leaders should go to the church and ask for the victims being cared for there. Tokitate says she never thought the severed heads of the Kingdom soldiers would be the right answer. Yotsuya replies that it may have met the conditions to be considered the goods. All of them are now together in Radodorbo. They only have a day and a half day left to traverse the map and complete the fourth stage. Shindo-san, Kusue, and Tokitate all suggest they should split up. In the town of Radodorbo, 
It is now snowing. Makua tells Kavel they have to postpone their departure from the city because of the blizzard weather conditions. He says the weather conditions particularly get rough in the mountains and he wishes the heroes are all alright. Kavel is thinking about the moment when she asks Yotsuya if he is leaving already. Yotsuya replies to her that he still has a quest to complete. They both wish each other goodbyes, and Yotsuya tells her to take care of herself. Makua calls Kavel, and she drifts from her thinking to reality. Kavel replies to Makua that they will postpone their departure, which will give them a chance to rest before returning home. She tells Makua to also take time to relax. Kavel ponders that it seems that her battle still continues and her homeland is on the battlefield, in the mountains. The heroes split to complete their quest of traveling across 5% of the map, but it will be a difficult task under the blizzard weather conditions. Yotsuya says to himself, it is a good thing he changes jobs more often because it gives him the opportunity to have enough clothing to cover himself. He knows that if he dies under the cold weather, he won't be able to revive because the situation will be similar to when a troll ate both Kusue and Shindo-san, which they were unable to revive back. Tokitate, on her own path, continues nagging that a sudden blizzard event is not going to make anyone happy, and also, if she is going to die, under the blizzard conditions, she wants to die of great excitement. She wonders if her teammates are able to walk under the blizzard conditions. Kusue suffers mostly under the blizzard weather, because of the type of clothing. She summons the courage to keep going, because she is still able to be of use to someone, even if it's only a little. Shindusan is also trying her best to complete their quest under the blizzard weather. She says she has been traveling for days non-stop, and also the snow keeps falling. She says to herself that she has to keep working hard and never relent because she doesn't want to die here. Afterward, Kusui's body starts to feel numb, but she says she has to keep going. She falls to the ground, hoping she will get back up soon. Yotsuya, still moving on under the blizzard weather, ponders that he does not blame the others if they stop moving. He says both Tokatate and Kusue do not have decent gear. They have about 10 more kilometers to complete in under 6 hours. His teammates have already stopped moving because of the blizzard weather. He hopes he will be able to complete their quest under the blizzard weather, and as long as one of them stays alive, they will be fine. He has to avoid freezing to death. He knows it would be best if he digs out a shelter and waits for the storm to pass, but if he stops moving, they will all die. As Yotsuya Yotsuya moves on, he encounters a monster. He gears up to fight the monster, because he can't run away under the blizzard conditions. He uses one of his abilities as a chef to identify the monster's weakness. After a few minutes of fighting the monster, he's able to defeat it. He says, if the monster had been just a little stronger and attacked him under a blizzard condition like this, he wouldn't have been able to defeat it. He says the monster must have been very hungry for it to attack him under a blizzard condition. The monster younglings come out of their hiding and start wailing. Yotsuya sees that the monster has babies, and also monsters are living things too. He ponders to himself whether he is supposed to feel bad for doing something so awful to them. He knows if the babies are left alone, they will either starve or freeze to death. He says it is none of his concern if they die or not because they are just virtual regardless. He continues traversing across the mountains. They have five hours left to complete their quest. He says to himself that he has made up his mind on one thing. All life is not equal, but fair. He says if there's anyone worth anything than him, or anyone stronger than him, he won't let them die. He knows if they are unable to clear the quest, they will all die in the real world. He keeps asking why they are chosen, and why they are being forced to do all this. In frustration, he stomps his leg on the ground, but falls into a hole and dies. Tokitati remembers the Majiha sisters' show. She admired them as a role model, since when she was a young girl, but because of her own limitations, she will never be a magical girl of love and hope. Yotsuya is able to revive back, because falling into the hole, gives his body the opportunity to maintain heat. He wonders if he is inside a secret dungeon. He says he is not expecting a place like this to be in the mountains. He continues to find his way out of the dungeon. Yotsuya sees on the map that Kusui is dead. Kusui can't revive back because of her body temperature under the cold weather. Shindo-san snaps to attention and also sees on the map that Kusui is dead. She says she has to complete this quest even if it's the last thing she will do. She navigates her direction through the map now that the wind has calmed down a lot. She sees a village from afar. She knows if she is able to make it to the village on time, she will be able to borrow a carriage that's faster than her walking and complete the quest. So, as to revive Kasui back, unknowingly to her, she is walking on a frazzle ice. The ice breaks and she falls into the cold water and dies. Yotsuya keeps looking for his way out of the dungeon, but always gets to a dead end. An earthworm digs its way out of the ground and digs right back into the ground. 
Yotsuya says it looks like the earthworm eats dirt just like the one in his world. He says it also looks like it's moving in the direction he hasn't gone yet and poses no threat to him. He keeps following the earthworm through the tunnel it's making. Another earthworm comes from Yotsuya behind and eats him. Toki Tate is still moving on and nagging that it's only her and Yotsuya left to complete the quest. Shindo-san and Kusue, revival gauges are still stuck at zero. She sees on the map that Yotsuya is also dead. She feels relieved, and she says, all this time she has been waiting for an excuse to give, but now no one will complain if everyone is dead before her. She says there's no way she will be able to complete the quest on her own, and she doesn't need to push herself further. She gives up and already accepts death. Afterward, the Majiha sisters appear to tokitate in a vision in the guise of delusion and motivate her not to give up. She stands up motivated and journeys on to complete their quest. Tokitate comes across a lady riding a typical animal. The lady offers Tokitate a ride. As they journey on, she asks Tokitate which direction she is going. Tokitate checks the map and sees they only have three minutes to complete the quest. Tokitate starts crying because they may never make it. They are yet to cover the remaining 5% of the map. The lady sees that Tokitate is in a hurry. She casts a spell and they move faster. Tokitate is surprised and asks if the lady is also a player. She replies to Tokitate that she is just a magician, in other words a magic user. She casts more spells which makes them move faster than before. Afterward, Shindu-san, Kusue, and Yotsuya are revived. Shindu-san asks them who completed the quest. Tokitate appears in front of them. The players are surprised to see it. it, is Tokitate who completes the quest. Tokitate ponders that it is her chance to take all the credit for herself but the Game Master appears behind her, startling her. The Game Master congratulates her for completing the quest and tells her that as a reward for completing the quest, she is given a chance to ask a question. She asks the Game Master if this world is actually virtual. The Game Master replies to her saying, Parallel Worlds. The Game Master explains the meaning of the Parallel Worlds concept to the players. The Game Master tells the players that they, the future people are capable of using special methods to observe and travel between parallel worlds that meet a certain condition. The condition is that the worlds exist on a similar wavelength. Yotsuya tries to ask the Game Master a question, but the Game Master replies that he doesn't have the right to ask a question. Furthermore, the Game Master tells them that the planet they are on is not a virtual reality and also exists in the same place as Earth in a parallel world. The Game Master says to the players that they are the ones who are virtual in this world. Hence, everything in this world they are right now is real. The sky, moon, creatures, and humans living in this parallel world to theirs are all perfectly real. Yotsuya realizes that the people in this world are just Earthlings that exist in parallel reality. He remembers the Diok soldier he burned alive and says he killed a real person. The players are back on Earth. Yotsuya keeps acting out strangely during training in school. Kusue finally joins the PE class. She and Shindu-san train together before they left the other world. Shindo-san asks Tokitate why Yotsuya is sad all of a sudden. Tokitate replies that when they saved the Arteros believers, Yotsuya killed a man. Yotsuya, on his way home, receives an email on his phone from the Game Master. He wonders if the Game Master is about to send him on another mission. He clicks on the mail to read the content, but shockingly to him, the Game Master is asking about his honest feelings now that he has killed someone. Without hesitation, he deletes the mail. Yotsuya gets home frustrated and asks himself if killing someone was part of the design and also because he believed it was virtual. He sees a child in front of him in his room. The child greets him. Yotsuya gets scared wondering how a child got into his room. He asks the child who she is. She replies to Yotsuya that he should have replied to her email. Yotsuya remembers that the Game Master sent him an email. He asks the girl in fear whether she is the Game Master or someone else from the future. The child replies to Yotsuya that he doesn't have a right to ask a question. Yotsuya realizes that the girl child is the Game Master. Yotsuya tells the Game Master that he didn't think it through because the Dayok soldiers were planning to kill some innocent religious people. He says the Dayok soldiers tricked them and they also tried to kill them as well. He says that the Dayok soldiers only believed that what they were doing was right. The Game Master tells Yotsuya that he has yet to answer her question. He replies that killing the soldier feels like a mistake and that if had known the truth about the world not being virtual, he wouldn't have done it. The Game Master tells Yotsuya she wants to show him the next player. Afterward, both Yotsuya and the Game Master are in a Chinese restaurant. The Game Master tells Yotsuya that the man sitting at the far end corner of the restaurant is a former drug dealer. She says in the next 20 seconds, the new player will enter the restaurant to kill the former drug dealer, that it's a certain man who has tricked him into thinking he won't be caught. The Game Master mentions the new player's age, his age, 
and also that of the younger brother's new player. Taria Keita and his gang walk into the restaurant with masks on and the intention of killing the former drug dealer. Yotsuya stops the killing and is also able to identify the new player's face through the information given to him by the game master. The man who brought the boys to kill the former drug dealer is informed that a kid has stopped the operation from succeeding. The man walks into the restaurant and threatens Yotsuya with a gun. The game master helps Yotsuya and he is able to defeat the man. The man still tries to shoot Yotsuya from behind, but the new player knocks him out. Afterward, Yotsuya tells the game master he has cleared the quest and he is going home. The game master persuades him to stay and talk for a while. The game master says he stopped a murder today. She then asks him how he felt when he killed the Dayok soldier. He replies that he doesn't really know, but now he knows what he has to do. He says, assuming those brothers get arrested today, his chances of success in the next quest will drop. He says it is a similar situation when the game master told him to woo Tokitate, and he was successful. It was Tokitate who ended up completing their last quest. Furthermore, Yotsuya says now his chance of success in their next quest will definitely increase. The game master asks Yotsuya whether he has any comments on Tori's life value. He replies to the game master that it has no value, and also every single person who is dumb enough to be tricked into killing deserves to die. Shindu-san and her school friends are in a restaurant. They hear another police siren outside and wonder what's going on. One of them says maybe there is a murder. Shindo-san gets carried away in thought after hearing the word, murder. Her friends just laugh it off and ask if she is okay. Kusu's mom comes back home and narrates the incident of a guy with a gun who was arrested today. Kusu doesn't seem to be scared about what her mom just said. Her mom is surprised and wonders if her daughter has changed a lot. Toki Tate at home tries to talk to her mom about how her day went, but she is ignored by her mom. Her mom, who is on live chat, is discussing a guy who was arrested with a gun. Yotsuya tells the game master he only fights for the justice that he believes in. At the school before the summer break, the students wonder when Shindo-san and Kusui became friends. They say both Kusui and Shindo-san literally have nothing in common. Back at home during the nighttime, Yotsuya plays a video game. He ponders about what the students said about both Shindo-san and Kusui. He says they may seem different, but they both have a deep-rooted strength. Yotsuya tells the heroes about the fifth player. He says, they all know they are about to be sent to the other world again. Later on, all the players are transported to the other world, including Tori, their fifth teammate. Tori's outfit terrifies Shindo-san, Kusui, and Tokitate. They say he is dangerous. The game master appears behind Tori, and touches him. Tori screams upon seeing the Game Master's face. The Game Master gives them a new quest. They are to offer the Jifun Bufo at Vikdomania within the period of 20 days. Their revival time increases to 50 seconds, but they can now fast travel. Although they can only time warp to any location they have visited at least once before. Yotsuya says that's standard, but with a lot of conditions. The Game Master spins the wheel, and Tori is assigned a warrior. The Game Master wishes them goodbye and disappears. Hence, Yotsuya suggests they all head to Cortinelle first to find out what the quest is about. Shindo-san replies that they have to explain things to Tori first. Yotsuya says once they time warp, they have to wait 24 hours before they can use it again. He says it's better they time warp now than wasting time dawdling around here. Tori says to Yotsuya, he doesn't like the way he said that. Yotsuya replies that their time is more important than one person's stress. Tori gets angry and is ready to pounce on Yotsuya, but Shindo-san tells them to stop. Shindo-san tells Tori that the world they are in is a parallel world and they're heroes. If they don't complete the quest, they will all die. Tori challenges Yotsuya to a duel. Tori says he won't fast travel unless Yotsuya accepts the challenge. Tori defeats Yotsuya in the duel. The other heroes are in shock after seeing Yotsuya's defeat. Afterward, they all time travel to Cortinelle. Yotsuya tells them that they should all go meet Kavel. Tori asks who Kavel is. Shindo-san replies that she is someone who helped in their last quest. They see Kavel in the town. Kavel, who is now a mother of two, says it's been 15 years now. Kavel says she doesn't know anything about Buffo, but there is an island called Jifan. The island is famous for its export of artisan weapons. Shindo-san asks Kavel if she is still a knight. Kavel replies she has retired as a knight and also lost her right hand in battle. She says the kingdom of Diok finally took action to unify the continent 15 years ago. She narrates how Cortinelle formed an allied army with other nations to oppose the Dayok kingdom. Later at down, Kavel and Yatsuya are talking outside about how they were so young then. Kavel tells Yatsuya how she has missed him. She thanks Yatsuya for involving her in the quest. She leans forward to Yatsuya and kisses him. She says, I have always loved you and breaks down in tears. Shindo-san, 
Kusue, and Tokitate are eavesdropping behind the wall. They all feel sad after hearing all that Cavell just said. Kusue also sees the young boy she saved in the village when a troll attacked them. The boy, who is now a grown-up man, thanks Kusui for her help in saving their village. Yotsuya ponders if their new encounter in this world is once in a lifetime. The heroes journey to Jufan Island through the means of a boat. The ritual dancers known as Vikadam welcome the heroes to their island. The Vikadam think they are mercenaries. The heroes tell the ritual dancers they are not mercenaries, but the mood of the Vikadam tanked instantly. Yotsuya asks the ritual dancers what the word Vikdamania means. They reply to him that it means a harvest festival. Shindo-san also asks them what the word Jifon Buffo means. One of the Vikadam gets angry and asks the heroes why they have to tell the heroes stuff for free, but Tori calms the Vikadam down. He says he will become a mercenary. The Vikadam shows the heroes that Jifon Buffo means a cow. Yotsuya says all they have to do to complete the quest is offer one of the cows at the harvest festival. The Vikadam says they can't have Vikdomania this year because of the orcs that have now occupied their castle. The Vikadam says, the orcs showed up five years ago, and war broke out. The orcs defeated them, and the island folks surrendered to the orcs. The orcs weren't just fighting their people, but also eating them. One of the Vikadam says that's why they offered Jifon Buffo to the orcs as an alternate food source. Thereby, all the Buffo belong to the orcs, and they can't use them for the human harvest festival. The orcs keep multiplying every year, and that is why they are looking for mercenaries to kill the orcs before the orcs kill them all. The Vikadam says during the harvest festival in 11 days, they want the heroes to kill all the orcs, starting with the orc queen. Kusui asks the Vikadam what they do. They reply to Kusui that they do ceremonial dances when the crops are planted and perform rituals when they are harvested. They are the only ones who can perform the rituals. Yotsuya says the safety of the Vikadam is also now a condition of their quest. A human spy tells the Orc Queen that the Vikadam are gathering mercenaries. The Orc Queen thanks the human spy for reporting the information to her. The mercenaries are now training the island folks for the battle against the Orcs. Yotsuya tells the leader of the mercenaries that they want to join them in the training. The leader of the mercenaries, Cantal, introduces himself to the heroes. He has fought many battles against the Orcs. He says an orc's weapons are the massive fists unleashed by the long arms, and a direct hit from one means instant death. Cantil tells them if they want to defeat an orc, they must attack efficiently and withdraw immediately. The key to fighting orcs is to stay out at their range at all times. Both Tori and Shindo-san make the team, while Yotsuya, Kusui, and Togiteti don't make the team because of their weapon types. Yotsuya gets angry because he didn't make the team, and says he will go raise his rank. He asks Yana and Aoyu, the ritual dancers, if there are any monsters on the island, he can eliminate. They reply to him that there is no monster on the island anymore except for the orcs. Their ancestors eliminated all the monsters ages ago. He ponders that a player can gain experience points by eliminating monsters and also doing tasks. He tells the ritual dancers he would like to farm. Yana tells Yotsuya that the fruits of the island do not grow too big because there are not enough nutrients in the soil. They only use bufo dung as fertilizer. But since there are not enough buffo, there are also low levels of fertilizer. Yotsuya suggests they use seaweed and shells as fertilizer. He cooks the shellfish to gain experience points as a chef, then crush the leftover shells and add buffo dung to the mixture. With the help of creature magic, he is able to speed up the reproduction and decomposing behavior of the microbes into fertilizer. He adds the fertilizer to the plant. He asks the ritual dancers if they have a radio or anything like music that can take his mind off the work. The Vekadam sings the ritual song, but Yotsuya gets angry because the song is an idol song. The island folks say they are tired of training because that is why they pay a lot of money to the mercenaries. Cantil tells them that it is not about money, but about determination. He says either they eliminate the orcs or they all die. The island folks keep arguing with the mercenarias, but one of the mercenarias sees an orc and calls the attention of the others to it. Shindo San and Torii charge toward the orc, but the orc with just one punch eliminates both Shindo San and Torii. They wait to revive back. The mercenaries attack the orc with full force, eliminating the orc within seconds. Cantil asks why an orc will come down from the castle today, of all days. One of the island folks says there must be a traitor among them who's been telling the orcs their plans. Yana and Ayu tell the island people that now is the time for them to be united. One of the island folks replies to both Yana and Aoyu that they are the ones who called the mercenaries here. 
and the island people were against it. They say to the Vicodom that it's because of them, they are now divided. Thanza, when he was a kid, ran away from the island. Thanza asks the island folks when they are now important enough to buy life and death. He asks if the island people want to protect money, or status, or the pride in a paradise they used their own hands to build. The island folks are motivated. They all respond that they will fight and defend their island. Afterward, the human spy goes again to the castle where the orcs are. He informs the orc queen about the mercenary's plots and plans. The orc queen promises that she will avenge the dead orc. Yotsuya is still adding fertilizer to the crops. The game master appears to Yotsuya and spins the wheel. Yotsuya, who is now at rank 10 as a wizard. The wheel stops spinning and his new job is blacksmith. Yotsuya remembers that Jifan Island is an exporter of artisan weapons. His new skills give him the opportunity to make weapons and armor, but all players can use them. The Vikadom takes Yotsuya to the island blacksmith to be his apprentice. Yotsuya's master is happy because Yotsuya assimilates and learns quickly. Yotsuya works overnight to make a weapon. Daytime, Yotsuya shows Kantil and the heroes the new weapon he just made, and also how the weapon works. Kantil is impressed. Yotsuya says he will be able to make as many weapons as they need, but he is going to make different weapons for both Kusui and Tokitat since they are not the best at close combat. In the workshop, Yotsuya tells Kusui that players cannot use weapons that are not of their gear, but they are lucky, he has the skill of blacksmith. Kusui persuades Yotsuya to try and get some rest because he has been working overnight without any sleep. Yotsuya tells Kusui he will make sure she and Shindo-san come back alive no matter what, but if Tori and Tokutate die, they will be replaced. Kantil walks into the workshop and says to Yotsuya that basing the players on eugenics is dangerous. Yotsuya replies that he is only basing it on the current situation and their future potential. Kantil says he was an officer and led his army into seven battles but lost all seven of them. He says he has lost so many men in battles and this is why he can't lose the battle against the orcs. Thereupon, the island harbor is under attack by the orcs. At the harbor, both the heroes and the mercenaries attack the orcs. The orcs eliminate both Tori and Shindo-san. Kantil is the last man standing to face the three orcs. Yotsuya is able to eliminate one of the orcs with the help of bow shooting bullets. Rice, one of the mercenaries, distracts and lures the orcs away from Kantil. The distraction gives Yotsuya the opportunity to fire at one of the orcs again. The orcs retreat immediately. Kantil thanks Rice for saving him. Thanza rescues one of the island folks from the riverbank, and Yotsuya heals him. Catnip says the orcs now have an advantage, but there is still an opportunity for them to recover the situation. Thereby, he says the wounded will be carried to the Vekadam cave, where they will be treated. All those available to fight will take their posts at the eastern high ground and western high ground. At the stronghold, Yotsuya puts both Kusui and Tokitate in charge of the bow. He says he and Rice will act as decors. Tokitate replies that it's exciting to have a weapon that's just for them, and she names the weapon the Orc Eater. One of the island folk signals to Yotsuya and Rice that orcs are coming. Yotsuya and Rice lure the two orcs away from each other. Kusui and Yotsuya fire a bullet from the Orc Eater at one of the orcs subduing it. The Game Master appears to Tokitate and congratulates her for reaching Tank 10 in her wizard occupation. The game Game Master spins the wheel, and Tokitate is assigned the hunter job. Tokitate is extremely happy about getting the hunter job. Yotsuya screams from afar that he needs help because the orc chasing him is getting momentum on him. Three of the orcs are eliminated. Yotsuya says the orcs are not approaching the stronghold again. He says maybe because the orcs have realized that the stronghold is now dangerous. He sees an orc and says he will find a way to divert the orc alone. Rice says he is already exhausted that the heroes have so much energy. Rice tells Yotsuya to be careful. Yotsuya ponders that his real one-on-one -on -one battle might not be far off. He attacks the orc, but his attack doesn't do much damage to the orc body. The orc eliminates Yotsuya. Yotsuya is still waiting to be revived. The orc starts throwing big pebbles at the wall of the stronghold. Also at the other side of the wall, another orc throws big pebbles. Tokitate shoots a bullet from the orc eater at one of the orcs, but the bullet only scraps his head. The orc becomes more aggressive and throws another big pebble creating a large hole in the wall. Rice attacks the orcs from behind, but his sword breaks into two. The orc swings his hand backward and hits Rice with full force. Yotsuya revives back and furiously attacks the orc by hitting the orc in the center of his head. The orc dies instantly. The other orc chases Yotsuya, but the orc trips over by the long rope they have set as a trap. This gives Tokitate the opportunity to shoot a bullet from the orc eater right in the head of the orc. The orc is also eliminated. Yotsuya, Kusue, and Tokitate all run to where Rice is lying down extremely wounded. Rice asks if they are able to beat the orcs. 
Yotsuya replies that they are able to, because of his help. Rice, now running out of life, says he is so weak, but Kusui breaks down in tears and says he isn't. Yotsuya holds Rice's hand, and also breaks down in tears. He tells Rice that he can brag to his best friend and war buddies, that he got to fight along with General Kantil. The attack on the stronghold, and the death of Rice, is reported to the eastern and western high ground. Tori is ordered to join the remaining heroes at the stronghold. Yotsuya tells the island folks to leave the stronghold and split up. He later realizes that the orcs might want to attack the Vicodom. One of the island folks reports to the heroes that the blacksmith is still in the workshop near the eastern high ground. Yotsuya says they should all go to the blacksmith workshop to get more bullets and later head for the Vicodom cave. Afterward, reports reach Cantil that there are five orcs remaining, but he says the number doesn't add up. They are also yet to see the orc queen. Thereby, Kantil and Shindo-san know the Orc Queen is going after the ship carrying the children. They see the Orc Queen at the harbor. She says, since they killed her own children, she will avenge them by killing theirs. She says, the island people made a pact with the Orcs, but it is also the island people who broke the pact. The Orc Queen looks both Shindo-san and Kantil in the eye and says, she will destroy them all as they wish. Shindo-san and Kantil fight vigorously with the Orc Queen. One of the mercenaries is eliminated by an Orc. Yotsuya tells the island folks to all head on to the blacksmith shop because it will be risky if they split. At the blacksmith workshop near the eastern high ground, they cannot use the bullets the blacksmith master is going to make because players can only use weapons that are part of their own gear. One of the island folks tells Yotsuya that they have to get the wounded mercenary to the Vicodom cave. Tokitate tells Yotsuya to escort the island folks that she will stay with the blacksmith. Yotsuya also notices Tokitate has changed jobs. Kusui says they won't be able to load the bullets the blacksmith is going to make into the orc eater, but the island folks will be able to. One of the island folks volunteers to stay and help them load the bullets into the orc eater. The rest of the island folks head to Vikadam Cave with Yotsuya and Rice. Afterward, at the sea bank side, the orc queen calls out to Kantil that he challenges her to fight but hides and Kantil calls himself a warrior. Both Shindao San and Kantil already have another plan to defeat the Orc Queen. The injured mercenary wakes up and asks where Yotsuya is. Yana replies that the heroes and some of the island folks head on to Kumamo Castle. The Kumamo Castle. Yotsuya ponders that there may be a few orcs in the castle, and if they can really eliminate them all. Tori motivates the island folks to charge toward the castle and take on the orcs. Shindu San distracts the Orc Queen. Shindu San and Kantil are ready to take on the Orc Queen from behind but the volcano on the island erupts. The eruption causes a large quake on the island and starts raining volcano bombs. Jifon Island is located between the continents of Mary and Illa. It's also known as the Disaster Island because of its frequent earthquakes and periodic volcanic eruptions. The Vakadam Cave starts falling apart, and the ritual dancers urge everybody to hurry outside. The ceiling of the cave falls apart, trapping Ioyu, who rushes inside the cave to rescue the wounded. One of the island folks holds and tells Yana not to go inside the cave because it's too dangerous, but he gets hit by one of the volcano bombs and dies instantly. Shindo-san is distracted by the eruption of the volcano. The Orc Queen hits Shindu-san and throws her into the river. Shindu-san won't be able to revive because she's still stuck in the water. The seawater recedes back and the Orc Queen says, maybe the sea floor collapses after all the shaking. Shindu San tries to warn Kantil in her spirit form not to fight the Orc because the seawater receding back means it is a tsunami warning sign. Later on, one of the island folks at the Vicodom says that the White Wall is coming. Yana starts singing one of their ritual songs. The water starts swallowing up the island. The island is now in despair and calamity. Aoyu escapes through a minecart with the wounded island folks and comes out through a secret passage. Yotsuya and his companions are surprised to see Aoyu in the castle. Aoyu asks what part of the castle they are. Yotsuya replies that it is the east side of the castle on the first floor. Yotsuya tries to break part of the castle but it won't budge. He asks Aoyu if the Vikadam are also the island's historians. Aoyu replies that they are also the storytellers who pass down the island's history. Yotsuya then asks if she knows where the castle's weaknesses are. He says they will bring down the whole castle to kill all the orcs inside. Aoyu says furiously that the castle is the symbol of their island and the castle doesn't have any weaknesses. Yotsuya is still determined to bring down the orcs. He says he will try and find a spot where they can fight with an advantage. Oyu asks Yotsuya how he can keep going on just for the sake of his goal, even when it means sacrificing himself. He replies that someone just needs to know his or her own limits. Aoyu says she now understands one thing. They do not have to stand still and do nothing. Yana narrates how her people start expanding to the low ground of the island. 
because they think more people, more fields, and more wealth means the island is prosperous. She breaks down in tears and says as a Vicodom, they should have communicated better with their people, but they neglected the legends that have been handed down for generations. The volcano erupts more loudly, and a beast comes out from the volcano. The beast is a dragon. Yotsuya sees the dragon and wonders what's going on, but they have to focus on the orcs. Yotsuya says he has two plans to eliminate the remaining orcs in the castle. The first plan is to lure the orcs and push them off the veranda. The orcs don't even step outside. Yotsuya says maybe they are being cautious of the volcanic bombs. The second plan is to lure the orcs with the island folks and attack the orcs unexpectedly. But the second plan doesn't work either. Yotsuya finds out that the orcs have a child. He tells Ayoyu about the orc child, and also tells her that the child has hair. Ayoyu says that's their next queen with a serious face. Most orcs are male, and males don't have hair on their heads. An orc queen can give birth to about a hundred babies in her lifetime, and about five of the children are female. Yotsuya says to Aoyu that she really knows about orcs. She replies that she read a book about orcs that they imported. Yotsuya asks what else the book says. Aoyu replies that orcs have their own language, and she can only remember one phrase from the orcs' language. The orc queen captures the ship and people on board, carrying the children of the island folks. She says it looks like the island is about to sink, and she must go and collect her family. Danza comes on board the ship from a small boat. The orc queen asks him what he wants, and she knows that his huge blade will be a problem for her. At the Kumamo castle, Tori compliments Yotsuya on his new plan. Yotsuya ponders that he never compliments other people, and that his hatred for humanity started with a hatred for people like himself. Aoyu calls out the orcs, with the phrase she learned from the book about orcs. The orcs are distracted. Tori throws and pinches his sword into the head of one of the orcs. Yotsuya pours the volcanic lava onto the body of the other orc. Yotsuya immediately carries the orc chilled and runs quickly to escape with the child. Afterward, at the blacksmith workshop, the workshop is now surrounded by lava. Tokitate says to Kusu that she just thinks about an idea, and she will be back. Yana wonders why she's experiencing a suffocating feeling, and why everybody is just weak all of a sudden. She realizes that it's their life force. She sees that it's the dragon sucking their own life force and that of everyone who just died. Vakadam can also use magic a little bit. The orc's language is called orcish, and some of the orc queens can speak the human language also. The orc queen is able to defeat Thanza because of the rising tide. She is about to finish him off when Shindo-san comes on board the ship. The orc queen is surprised to see Shindo-san alive. The receding water helps Shindo-san to be able to revive back. Shindo-san attacks the orc queen carefully and efficiently. The blacksmith falls to the ground unconsciously and starts burning up. Kusu drags the blacksmith to where he will be able to breathe well. Tokitate calls Kusu from afar to catch a bullet. She extracts the bullet from one of the dead orc's bodies. The lava comes rushing toward Tokitate and eliminates her. The blacksmith wakes up and tells Kusu that they should draw the orc eater together, since they now have a bullet. The orc queen cuts Shindo-san into two parts, she says before Shindo-san comes back alive. She will finish killing Thanza, Kusue, and the blacksmith fire the orc eater from afar, and the bullet hits the orc queen in her stomach. Shindo-san says the waves must have tossed the boat onto the island. The orc queen breaks down in tears and says she has to get to her family and protect them. Thanza rushes toward her and pushes his sword into the orc queen's stomach, and both of them fall off the ship. The orc queen is eliminated. The ship heads straight to the lava, but Thanza tries to stop the ship, and he is covered by the lava. The orc continues to chase Yotsuya to rescue the orc child. Yotsuya says he hates humans because they are the only species on earth that kills as they like. Yotsuya throws the orc child off the bridge, but the orc catches the orc child. Yotsuya has already stabbed the orc child. He pushes the orc holding the orc child off the bridge into the lava. The orc still holds the orc child tightly upwards so that the lava won't burn her. But the excruciating pain prevails, and they both sink into the lava. Yotsuya becomes sad about what he just did, and says he is so weak that he is weaker than anyone. Yotsuya and Tori walk under the falling debris from the volcano. They are looking for the dragon. They see one of the island folks and ask him what he is doing outside here. He replies that his name is Raji, and he is just inspecting the land, but ends up stranded there. He asks where the heroes are heading. Tori replies that they are going to do some hero work. They see the dragon, and Tori charges toward the dragon, but the dragon eliminates him with a large fire force. Yotsuya gets scared and runs away. He says he can't be able to beat the dragon right now. 
The dragon sucks life force to replenish its energy. Everybody at the Vicodom cave now looks weaker than before. Yana says someone is casting a magic spell on them. Drain magic is a high-level magic that only powerful sorcerers can use. Yotsuya says he has to get all the island folks away from the island, and that it's the best way to drive the dragon back without fighting it. He sees that Raju is still where they left him. He carries Raji and runs hurriedly. Raji laughs and says he is the dragon bishop who summoned the Darasue dragon. He thinks Yotsuya now knows who he is. Yotsuya drops him still in shock hearing what Raji just said. Yotsuya immediately realizes that it is Raji who brought the orcs to the island. Raji starts reciting incantations to cast magic on Yotsuya, but Yotsuya charges towards him. Raji eliminates Yotsuya with magic. Yotsuya revives back, but every time he revives, Raji eliminates him. Tori tries to sneak attack Raji from behind, but Raji dodges him. Tori walks up to Yotsuya and asks him if Raji is an enemy. Yotsuya says furiously that they could have surrounded Raji. Raji then fires them with his magic. He says he heard that heroes don't die, and this looks like a waste of time. He runs away. Yotsuya remembers that the Vikadam must be protected if they want to complete their quest. Raji attacks Aoyu at the castle. Aoyu remembers him instantly because he is from the island. Raji is the child prodigy who learned to stand, walk, and talk faster than any of the other kids. Raji is also a design engineer and is the one who told the island folks to build houses on the low ground of the island. Aoyu says the mastermind has been on the island all along, yet they brought mercenaries out here and waged on the orcs and let so many people die. Raji casts another magic on Aoyu, but Yotsuya blocks the magic. Yotsuya holds Aoyu's hands and runs away from Raji. He tells Aoyu he is going to need her help. Yotsuya and Aoyu stand face off with Raji. Raji thinks they have given up and says he will kill them gladly. Yotsuya and Aoyu use the creature's magic to increase the persuasiveness of their words and tell Raji to stop. Yotsuya knows his magic and Aoyu's own may not be enough individually but if they use the magic with the same catalyst, which works as an amplifier. Tori attacks Raji from behind, but Raji blocks Rice's spear with his hand. Raji is injured and runs away. He escapes with the dragon. Yotsuya sees a magic tool Raji dropped when escaping. Tori shows them where he has seen the color content of the magic tool. It is where Raji sits when they are looking for the dragon. Afterward, Yana realizes that the absorption of power has weakened and the flow has changed. She realizes that it is a six magic circle and they must erase it. The magic absorbs life through six magic circles on the island. One of the mercenaries is able to determine the location of the remaining six magic circle. With her map, they are able to erase all the six magic circles. The Darasueta dragon is not able to suck life force anymore and goes back into the volcano or the mountain. The heroes and the islanders pay their respects to Thanza who is now a pillar, as a result of hardened lava. Thanza is the one who stops the boat from burning, and saves the island's future. Yotsuya says love and hate are two sides of the same coin. He thanks Thanza for all he's done. The heroes are able to offer the Jifon Bufo at Vekadamania. The Vekadam thanks the heroes for everything. Yotsuya says they only did it to fulfill their own goals. AOU replies that they will never forget everything they have learned, and it will be handed down to the next generation. Cantle drifts on the sea with a broken wood. Raji sees him and tries to attack him with the dragon, but a great sorceress eliminates him and the dragon. The players are back on Earth. An English-speaking girl comes looking for Yotsuya. Yotsuya remembers what the game master told him, that in the future, he would meet the sixth player. She tells Yotsuya that her name is Glenda and that she wants to take videos of Yotsuya. She is also a videographer. Yotsuya asks if she has been to the other world several times. She replies that she has never been there. Glenn says she knows four people online who insist they have been to another world and come back. The four people don't have any sort of connection together. Glenn says one of the four people's username is Yukarion. Yotsuya knows that it's Tokitate. Glenn says one of the four people passed away, and the last comment she left is cleared the fourth round. Now that the fifth round is about to start, Yotsuya realizes that she may have failed a quest and dies in this world. Glenn suggests they start posting stuff themselves. Afterward, Yotsuya invites Kusue and Shindo-san to his grandparents' house. They start filming their encounters and experiences in the other world. Yotsuya says, considering the number of views this stuff gets, 
there's a good chance some players will be among its viewers. Yotsuya thanks Shindo-san for coming all the way out here. Shindo-san reminds Yotsuya about her pay since she is an amateur model. He replies that they are only doing this for their own benefit. Shindo-san says she will not collect any pay because she wants Yotsuya to start being polite and friendly around the other players. A few days later, their short film is completed and uploaded to a video site. Then 10 days after its release, a user comments that he or she also knows about the other world and that they are players too. Later on, the players are transported back to the other world. The game master spins the wheel for the sixth player. Glenn is assigned the warrior job. They also notice that Kusue has changed jobs to a heavy warrior. Kusui tells them that it is when they are on Jifan Island, and the orc queen died. Yotsuya ponders that maybe Kusui will finally be strong enough to keep up with them. The game master tells them that their next quest for the fifth round is as follows. Quest A is that they have to reduce Rainbow Stair Edition in the Kingdom of Goldia to less than 3% and the time limit is 90 days. Quest B is they have to stop the destruction of the village of Zagroth and the time limit is 30 days. The players are mesmerized. The game master tells them that they can choose any one of the quests they prefer. Yotsuya thinks they should choose A because B looks easier but is more ambiguous. Tori tells the game master that they will take quest B. Yotsuya gets angry at Tori that he doesn't have to decide for them. The game master disappears. Kusue says they need to find the village of Zagroth first. Tokitate suggests they all go to Cortinel and ask Cavill again. They get to Cortinel but see Cavill's daughter instead. She shows the heroes her mother's burial ground and thanks them for all they did for her mother when she was alive. Later on, she tells them to follow some merchants, but the merchants are not going into the village. She tells the heroes before they part ways that traveling with the heroes was her mother's proudest accomplishment. It's been 17 years now, and Kavil's daughter is all grown up. A lot of time passes in the world, every round they complete. The heroes get to a small pathway in the jungle, leading to the direction of the village of Zagroth. They try to find their way out of the jungle. They see a goblin, and the heroes attack it but the goblin is a lot stronger than the ones they know before. Glenda is able to eliminate the goblin. Torai sees someone in the jungle but the person runs away. The heroes split to search for the person. Kusui and Glenda find a little girl in a small house. The little girl is able to recognize them as the heroes. Kusui calms the little girl down and tells her not to be afraid of them. The little girl tells the heroes that her name is Jesby. Tori asks her why she runs away from them. She replies that she thinks they are from the village. They realize that she is also from the village of Zagroth, and they ask her where the village is. She shows them a monolith, and she says that is where the village is. Yotsuya asks her to take them to the village, but it looks like she won't. Yotsuya wonders if they are chasing the little girl. The next day, the heroes help Jesby with chores. Kusue and Glenda encounter a human being looking like a monster. Jesby sees the human being looking like a monster and she says, Father, Jesby loses consciousness. Apparently, her father was being controlled by a wireworm. The heroes have no other choice but to eliminate him. A wireworm controls its host body by parasitizing its brain. The parasite itself will not die if cut or crushed. The only ways to eliminate it are by burning it or desiccating it. Jesby regains consciousness the next day and tells the heroes that there is a secret passage into the village. Tori asks what made Jesby suddenly decide to take them to the village. Shindo-san replies that it must have been what happened yesterday. They get to the secret passage, but it looks pretty deep. They are in a cave that looks like a limestone cave. Shindo-san asks how much further to the village. Jesby replies that about half a day. Yotsuya notices that there are vampire bats in the cave as well. Tori says he will take care of the vampire bats since they are weaker than goblins. Yotsuya warns him that the vampire bats might be stronger now. They all leave Tori to battle with the vampire bats. Later on, Tori gets to where the heroes camped breathing profusely. Shindo says to Tori that she is glad that he would have gotten some experience out of it. Jesby explains how a chosen few leave the village to search for a place where they can live more safely. She says her father was one of them. Shindo-san asks why they do that. Jesby replies that the monsters that attack them are now stronger, and every year they are able to harvest fewer and fewer crops. The village chief said they can't keep living in the village much longer. Jesby says, it's older people who are chosen because they can't do their jobs anymore. The idea is that they can at least help the village that way, and that's why the villagers call the journey of hope the journey of death in secret. She says her father and a young man named Dan tried to convince the village chief, but the village chief said otherwise. Her father and Dan ended up being sent on the journey of hope. After that, her mother falls sick. She says it has only been her and her little brother, and that is why she left the village to bring her father back home. She tried to convince her father to come home, but her father said she would be executed for leaving the village. 
Jesby says the next day her father left saying he was going to talk to the village chief but never came back until the very moment he had already turned into a wireworm. Kusue asks Jesby where Dan is. She replies that he has already gone to a place called New Eden, somewhere in the world. She says her father was against it but Dan went anyway and never came back. The next morning, Jesby scouts the entrance of the village and comes back to the heroes to tell them that no guards are there. The heroes are now in the village of Zagroth. They cross paths with Jesby's neighbor on their way to her house. Jesby finds out that her mother is dead and she breaks down in tears. She asks Frock, her neighbor, for her little brother. Her little brother won't talk and he doesn't answer when anyone talks to him. He has been like that since his mother's death. Jesby burst into tears. Yatsuya says he wants to take a look around the village. Glenn volunteers to follow him. Yatsuya and Glenn cross paths with the village chief granddaughter, Iris Dirayo. She asks what they are doing in their village, and that her village doesn't need heroes. They realize that her grandfather is the village chief, Cox Dirayo. Afterward, both Yatsuya and Glenn are at the village chief's mansion. Cox says he has heard rumors of great heroes who travel traveled the world saving people. He says Zagroth is the very image of peace, so there is no requirement for the aid of the heroes. Yotsuya replies to the village chief that they have also heard about their frequent attacks by unusually strong monsters and if he could allow them to protect the village. Cox asks Yotsuya, who tells them about the monsters. The village chief's granddaughter replies that it's Jesby, and she saw her walking with them. The village chief says he feels terrible for what he has done to Jesby, but it's for the safety of their village. He says he is so grateful that she has returned to the village, and they already have a secret plan to defeat the monsters. Cox tells the heroes he would like to show them the secret plan. Later on, he takes them to a basement, but tricks them, and locks both Glenn and Yotsuya in a small cell in the basement. He tells them that they are a greater threat to him than the monsters. The village chief comes looking for Jesby, but he is surprised to see more heroes at the house. He lies that he is there on Yotsuya and Glenn's request to forgive Jesby. Shindu-san asks the village chief where Yotsuya and Glenn are right now. He replies that they are at his mansion, and he wouldn't mind if they also follow him to his mansion and be taken care of as well. The heroes agree, but Shindo-san seems something is shady about all this. She later agrees to follow them to the village chief's mansion. Cox tells his guards that after he has left with the heroes, they should capture Jesby. The guards come back after the village chief has left with the heroes, but Frock tries to stop them, and he is subdued. The village chief tricks the heroes onto a rope bridge, and cuts the bridge. The heroes hold on to the dangling rope bridge. The village chief tells them that he doesn't have to go through the trouble of locking them in the dungeon, like the other two heroes. He says the bog beneath them is bottomless, and once they fall it's over, because even monsters never make it back out. In the dungeon, Yotsuya and Glenn hear a loud monster roar. Yotsuya says it's probably a big monster. The guards who arrest Jesby say they heard a monster roaring, and they must report it to the village chief. Frock says he has to save Jesby, but his mother replies that he will only be chased out of the village just like his brother Dan. The heroes have now subdued the village chief and tied him up. They tell the village chief to take them to his house. The villagers are also at the village chief's house demanding to see him because they all heard a monster's roar. The villagers look back and see the village chief has been held captive by the heroes. Chief Cox says all he did was carry out his duty as the village chief by capturing Jesby who broke their rules. Jesby is also escorted to the chief's mansion with the guards. The villagers ask why the heroes do such a thing. Chief Cox replies that the heroes are obviously sent here by outsiders to take Zagroth from them. Brock tries to save Jesby, but he is subdued again. One of the villagers says, they do not care why the heroes came to the village, but they should leave quietly. Frock's mother comes to the chief's house and also defends her son. Chief Cox says, the mother and Frock shelter Jesby, and they bring disaster to the village just like Jesby, because the monster's roar proves it. Chief Cox tells the villagers that if they don't capture both Frock and his mother, disaster will befall the village. The villagers try to capture Frock and his mother, but Tori becomes angry seeing this injustice. He hits the village chief and also the villagers furiously. The villagers run away saying the hero is going to kill them. Tori tells Chief Cox that if he doesn't set Yotsuya and Glenn free right now, he will kill him. In the village chief house, Iris tells the heroes that she has tossed the key to the dungeon down the old well. The old well behind the village chief house. Chief Cox tells the heroes that the bottom of the well dried up years ago, and they will never get the key back. Jesby thanks Frock for his help. Frock tells Jesby to go back with his mother, and he will go meet the heroes. He says the village chief might still be plotting something. Thereafter, Brock sees a big monster over the monolith. He rushes inside the village chief and tells the heroes about it. 
the heroes see that there are a bunch of monsters looming in the village, Chief Cox laments that this is the end of the village. Soon there is a loud banging underneath the reception table in the house. The heroes think the monsters are already there, and gears up. Yotsuya and Glenn come out of the dungeon from underneath the reception table. The village chief is surprised to see them. Yotsuya says to Chief Cox that the walls of the dungeon are solid, but what is the point when the ceiling is just wood? Yotsuya sees that all the monsters are stronger than they should be. The monsters ride the back of the big monster into the monolith. Yotsuya ponders if the destruction of the village refers to the area of the village or the people living there. Yotsuya says, it's impossible to take on the swarms of monsters. Kusue says, there might be an escape route. She suggests they use the old well as an escape route because it may lead to the limestone cave. She jumps into the well and lands in the limestone cave. After she revives back, she sends Yotsuya a signal. The heroes make a ladder for the villagers to climb in the old well. The villagers run toward the village chief's house, but the giant monster eliminates them all. Frock also finds out that his mother is dead. The heroes Cox, Iris, Frock, Jesby, and Jesby's little brother are able to escape using the old well as an escape route from the village into the limestone cave. They make it out of the cave after six hours. Tori asks that they should now take all the stuff and do what? Yotsuya replies that these are not stuff, but these people are important for completing the quest. The hero sees a cross path and wonders if people are living around there. Yotsuya and Glenn go to investigate the area to see whether it's truly people or goblins living there. They get to a settlement. Yotsuya says, maybe it's a thieves hideout. Yotsuya and Glenn inspect the camp, and Yotsuya says, maybe there is nobody there in the settlement. Unknowingly, to the heroes, there are goblins lurking around in the bush. Shindu San says that Yotsuya and Glenn are taking a while. Kusu replies that she hopes they get back to them before sundown. Tori sees goblins on top of the tree they are sitting down. The heroes gears up to fight the goblins. Tori tells Tokitate to get the kids and Chief Cox out of there. The heroes fight and eliminate some of the goblins, but one of the goblins tries to attack Shindo-san from behind. The Game Master appears suddenly and congratulates Shindo-san for reaching rank 10. Shindo-san changes jobs to an elite warrior. Kusue and Tori are surprised to see that Shindo-san has changed jobs. She tells them to leave the rest of the goblins to her and she eliminates the remaining goblins swiftly. Tokatate and the villagers are still on the run and encounter a goblin. Tokatite tries to attack it, but the goblin doesn't budge to Tokatate's attacks. The goblin is about to eliminate Tokatate, but Glenn eliminates it from behind. Brock sees her brother Dan with Yotsuya. They are so happy to see each other. Apparently, the settlement Glenn and Yotsuya see the other time. The people who left on the journey of hope stay in the settlement. Chief Cox is surprised to see the villagers. Haka cooks for the heroes. He was a cook before he left the village. Jesby tells Dan about the death of her father and that of his mother. One of the villagers says those who were run out of the village are alive and those who stayed are now dead. Later on, Dan tells the heroes that when he was looking for New Eden, he came across this settlement. He says before he got here, they didn't have much to eat, but since he is a hunter, they now have more to eat. Tori asks Tokatate if their quest is now cleared. She replies to Tori that, not yet. Yotsuya tells Dan that they should leave this place sooner rather than later. He says that he suspects the monsters that attack Zagroth are being controlled by someone, and he thinks there's a good chance that the swarm of monsters will attack here also. Dan asks him how he knows all this. Yotsuya ponders that it's only been 15 days since their quest started. He replies to Dan that it's his hero intuition. Dan agrees with Yotsuya's suggestion. Shindo-san asks Dan what New Eden means. He replies that a legend has been passed down through generations, that eternal peace is guaranteed there. The original goal of the journey of hope was to search for New Eden, and young people were chosen for it. Dan says, it's now just an excuse to get rid of people seen as troublemakers. Chief Cox replies to Dan, that only those who choose to die themselves are led to New Eden. Dan stands up angrily and says to the village chief that he has been lying to the villagers all this while. Jesby says New Eden is real. She says she just remembered what her parents told her, that there are people living behind the forest. Yotsuya says, they have to find a place where the villagers can live permanently. Jesby begs the heroes that with their help, they can find New Eden. Dan tells the heroes that there is a goblin settlement ahead, and they have to pass through the settlement to get out. Yotsuya says the goblins will be gathered in one place, which makes a sneak attack easier. The heroes and the villagers journey on. Dan tells Yotsuya that the villagers can't keep walking any longer. During the nighttime, the heroes have to carry out the operation of wiping out the goblin settlement. Yotsuya picks Shindo-san, Tori, 
and also Dan, as their guide. Yotsuya tells Glenn to take care of things while they are gone, at the goblin settlement. They see some goblins and wonder if they are guards. Yotsuya tells his other players that he will erase his presence with creature magic and eliminate the goblins. Yotsuya eliminates the goblins and tells his teammates to split up and eliminate the other sleeping goblins in the nest. The heroes find out that the sleeping goblins are just decoys and they don't have a choice but to fight the remaining goblins. Afterward, Tokitate tells Glenn that there is trouble. She says she was patrolling and found the village chief lying on the ground. The village chief has been murdered. Glenn tells the old folks that the chief has been murdered and the crime was clearly committed by human hands. Yotsuya and his teammates are able to take down the goblin settlement, but a few of the goblins run away. The next day, the village chief is buried. Glenn says they should all head to the goblin settlement for now. Dan thanks Yotsuya for his help. Yotsuya asks Shindo-san and Tokate to use their magic and also check their MP. They are surprised that they still have plenty of MP left. Iris tells Tori about a flying monster she saw when she still lived in Zagroth. Glenn is able to identify the village chief assassinator. It is Jaka. The heroes toss him to one of the best in the goblin settlement. Afterward, the heroes see Iris walking into the nest where Jaka is. Tori follows her quickly. Iris has already killed Jaka but she is now being controlled by a wire worm. Iris is eliminated and her body is burned. Yotsuya ponders that Iris has been with them the whole time and wonders how she got infected. The heroes bury Iris's ashes. Dan tells the heroes that everyone feels weak and tired for unknown reasons. The heroes realize that it's the same symptoms they saw on Jiffin Island. Tokitate asks if any dragon bishop is doing another ritual somewhere around here. Shindo-san cheers Tori up because he feels sad about the death of Iris. Shindo-san says she doesn't want to die in a situation as unfair as this. She taps and tells Tori that they must survive until the very end. Shindo-san suggests she and Tori go to the beach after completing the quest when they are back in their own world. Afterward, Jesby tells the heroes that New Eden is past the rising sun on the other side of the forest. Glenn asks Yotsuya what they should do. Yotsuya replies that if a dragon bishop really is involved in all this, it will be dangerous to just go in blind. A hordes of monsters attack the heroes. Yotsuya tells Dan to take everyone and run. Glenn also instructs Kusue and Tokate to take the kids. The heroes battle with the monsters, but it seems the monsters are now much stronger. Jesby's little brother trips off a log of wood and hits his head on the ground. The heroes eliminate the remaining swiftly and technically. Tokitate and Kusui run back to where the other heroes are. A troll comes out from the forest and eliminates Shindu San instantly. The troll eats Shindo San. Kusu charges toward the troll, but the troll also eliminates and eats her. Kantil uses his magic to scare off the troll. Yotsuya is perplexed seeing Kantil. Yotsuya says it's been 17 years now, and he heard the tsunami took Kantil away. Kantil replies that someone saved his life the great sorceress Fatina. Tokitate remembers that she had heard the name before and says Fatina has also saved her life once. Kantil tells the heroes that he became Fatina's student after she saved him and now he is training in sorcery. Yotsuya asks if sorcerers and dragon bishops are enemies. Kantil replies that the dragon bishops are a group that seeks to resurrect the dragons and should the dragon return, humanity will be destroyed. He says they exist to stop that from happening, and it is Fatina who sensed that a dragon bishop is in this area. A meteorite containing immense magic power fell near here several months ago. Cantil tells the heroes that he found one of the pieces of the meteorite over the mountain. The meteorite has the ability to boost magic power. This is the reason the monsters are now stronger. Cantil tells the heroes that the blood ritual requires the life force of humans, and the village he came across has already been destroyed. He says perhaps the power taken from it wasn't enough because the ritual is still being performed. Kantil shows them Yggdramapal seeds and says they grow by absorbing magic power. Growing the seeds will seal the magic power of the meteorite and also seal the abnormal strength of the monsters. Yotsuya says he will grow the seeds as much as possible with the creature magic. Kantil narrates how they also eliminate a dragon bishop hiding in the Diok kingdom. Glenn asks Kantil why the dragon bishop was in the kingdom. Kantil replies that the dragon bishop wants to start a war and use the lives consequently lost in the blood ritual. Yotsuya uses the creature magic to grow the Yggdramapal seed. 
Tokitate says it looks like the thing from Jack and the Beanstalk. Tori sees fruits on the Yggdramapal plant. Cantil tells him that the fruit is edible, and also tells the heroes that he is going to investigate the area and find more pieces of the meteorite. Afterward, Yatsuya tells Glenn to take care of things at the settlement. The other heroes are on a mission to save both Shindu-san and Kusue from the troll's belly. Yatsuya and his teammates are able to trace the troll at the far end of the forest without using the location map. The heroes battle with the troll but the troll is now much stronger than before. After a few clashes with the troll, Tori is able to eliminate it. The troll's stomach is cut open, and both Shindu-san and Kusue revive back. The heroes have to find the new Eden. Thereafter, they come across a waterfall at the far end of the forest. Yotsuya is able to grow a Yggdramapal seed over the wall of the waterfall, because Tori brings the seeds along. Lanan, Jezbi's little brother, wakes up and is able to speak again. Yotsuya and his teammates climb onto the plant to the other side of the waterfall. They get to the other side of the waterfall, but there is no sign of living things beyond the region. Yotsuya ponders, if he falls into the water from here, he won't be able to come back alive. But he remembers what Chief Pak said about the new Eden story. He tells his teammates, he is going to jump into the waterfall. Toki Tate says he will never survive a fall into a plunge pool, but he jumps into the waterfall anyway. Yotsuya comes out from underneath the water, into another dimension. He is in awe to see a town, with people living in it. Yotsuya asks the people of the town who they are. One of them replies that it's been a long time since anyone came here and they are people who live in the town with harmony and peace. One of them also tells Yotsuya that he also drifted from outside himself and that he used to live in a small village called Zagroth. Yotsuya is surprised and asks if the name of the town is New Eden, but they reply that the town has no name. A town with no connection to the outside world doesn't really need one. At the Goblin Settlement, Lanan says he doesn't know who Jesby is and he doesn't have a big sister. Jesby tells Lanan to look at her closely and her eyes glow. Glenn realizes that Jesby is the Dragon Bishop. She asks Jesby why she set the wireworm on Iris. She says before Iris gets infected, Jesby is the one with her. Jesby replies that why would she do that? And also Glenn doesn't have any proof. Glenn says when they first met Jesby, she walks into the forest filled with monsters unconcerned. When they were heading to Zagroth, she headed to the village alone first to cast a spell to plant memories of her on all the villagers. Dan's initial reaction when he met Jasby showed he didn't know who she was. Glenn continues to prove that Jasby is the dragon bishop. She says Jasby also made the old folks annihilate Cox because the old folks confessed. Dan asks Glenn why she didn't tell them anything from the beginning when she starts suspecting Jesby. Glenn replies that she wants to be entirely sure and ends up sacrificing Iris because of that. Glenn gears up and attacks Jesby, but Jesby swiftly dodges the attack. Jesby changes back to her true form and calls for her wyvern. Brock realizes that what Iris was telling them about her seeing a flying monster is true. Jesby says she has been flying over the area for a while and sensed many human lives at the waterfall area but doesn't see a large city. She narrates how she made contact with Bane, because she wanted information about the humans she had sensed but was unable to see. She tells them that it is Bane who told her about the legend of New Eden, but he starts to feel suspicious, and she turns him into a monster. Jesby says when the heroes showed up, she just had to make them search the place called New Eden. Dan asks Jesby if she killed his mother. She replies that she didn't actually kill her, but left her to die when the monsters attacked Zagroth. Cantil appears suddenly and attacks Jesby, but she takes off with her wyvern. Kentil says he can't believe that Jesby is the Dragon Bishop. Jesby replies that it is because Kentil is a third-rate sorcerer. Jesby says that it's too late now. Afterward, Yatsuya comes out from the water. He tells his teammates about the underground city. Tori asks if they can bring the displaced villagers to the city. Yatsuya replies that they can but now that he thinks of it, the troll found them so easily. Toki Tati asks Yotsuya if the troll didn't follow their location data. Yotsuya replies that the troll did when they just happened to come across the waterfall, meteorite, and the city. Jesby replies that Yotsuya is right because she planned everything. The heroes are shocked. Glenn and Cantil track Jesby to the waterfall. Glenn tells the other heroes that Jesby is the dragon bishop. Jesby casts a spell to make all monsters obey her will. All the monsters in the forest come out and charge towards the waterfall. The heroes realize that the monsters are not after them, 
but the city on the other side of the waterfall. The heroes gear up and battle with the monsters. Another giant monster comes out from the forest. Glenn asks if the meteorite is making the monsters much stronger. Jesby replies that not only that, but with the power of the meteorite, she will be able to resurrect the great dragon. The giant monster fires its toxic liquid towards the waterfall. Yotsuya asks Kantil where the magic circle is. Kantil replies that he can't find it anywhere. Later on, he realizes where the magic circle is, but Jezbi hits him with magic. Yotsuya tries to heal him, but he tells Yotsuya not to worry about him. He says to get the magic circle they must destroy the golems, and there are six of them. Yotsuya tells the heroes that they have to eliminate the golems. He says the golems have a magic circle on their backs, and if they are able to destroy them, the blood ritual will fail. Jesby realizes that the heroes have figured it out. She controls some of the monsters to attack the heroes. Yotsuya ponders that they have to get rid of the source now. Yotsuya attacks Jesby from behind. Jesby is shocked and asks how Yotsuya is able to attack her without her noticing him beforehand. Yotsuya replies that he can use creature magic too. Jesby creates a shield over herself. Yotsuya tries to break the shield, but he is unable to. Jezbi says to Yotsuya that she has always wanted to see what will happen if a hero is dismantled at a cellular level. Yotsuya tries to break the meteorite piece they are standing on, but his weapon breaks. Jezbi continues her spell but Yotsuya throws one of his weapons at her. The weapon cuts Jezbi's hand before Jezbi is able to finish the incantation. Yotsuya runs towards her and plants one of the Yggdramapul seeds into the open wound on Jezbi's hand. Yotsuya fastens the growth of the Yggdramapul seed with creature magic. The magic effects on the monsters wear off. The heroes immediately destroy the magic circle on the backs of the golems and also eliminate all the monsters. Afterward, Kantil says the heroes have saved his life again. Yotsuya wakes up. Kantil tells Yotsuya that he was perpetually emitting mana because of the meteorite's power. Kantil says no normal human being could have withstood that. Jezbi still lives, even though the Yggdramapal plant has already grown inward out of her. Yotsuya is about to kill Jezbi when Kusue stops him. Kusue in tears begs Yotsuya not to kill Jezbi. Glenn also tells Yotsuya that they should let the people of this world settle this world affairs. Yotsuya agrees but says he doesn't have the intention of forgiving Jezbi's sins. Jezbi eliminates herself with her own magic. Suddenly, the meteorite breaks into pieces and the sorceress Fatina appears. She tells Kantil that they are going to retrieve all of the meteorite fragments. The villagers of Zagra join the people living in the underground city. They thank Yotsuya for his help and tell him that he can ask for anything. Yotsuya asks them if they can give the town a name. He says they should call the town Zagra. Thereafter, the game master tells Glenn that she can ask a question as a reward for the completion of their quest. Glenn asks the game master if the dragon can appear in their own world. The game master replies that there is a small hole that connects the two worlds and the hole continues to widen. Eventually, the dragon will enter. The heroes are back on Earth and they continue their daily lives.